I always remember there being like one kid who was young. He's young. Yeah. He's really skinny. And he's wearing like very baggy, like uh, carpenter jeans and a long black, probably a stained T-shirt. And he's <laughs> wait, is it stained or is it the band stained? The band stained. Okay. It's always <laughs> like a new metal band, like a radio rock new metal band, like butt rock. Yeah. And he's in the pit and just kind of like swinging around, like he twirls a lot, and then he tries yeah, to kind of like shoulder lot. people. Yeah, yeah that, kid's name is Travis. that kid's name is Travis. Travis. Sure. <laughs> That's you usually bucks. have like kind of a bowl cut thing going on too. Where they like yeah. To grow yeah. Hair out. yeah, absolutely. Very works straight at, hair. Yes. Works at Pizza Hut. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's, tra- That's the Trav I know and love. Hey everybody, we are back with another episode of Growing Up Nerds. I'm Sam. I'm Casey. And I don't think I said another very clearly. I'm pretty sure I blended that together in a weird way. Uh, but this is cool because uh, we're hanging out in the same room. Yeah, how about that? Sam came to visit. And uh, yeah. It's just been like... Flew here. Did you see the video that I posted on the podcast page? Which... Uh, yeah <laughs> with like the dude in this is like an old man in a speedo with free bird plan and he's just like flying on top of an eagle yeah it was funny <laughs> uh my friend jesse responded to that with uh saying that it's he's very proud of me for fulfilling my dreams of having the audacity to wear a speedo so <laughs> i made it i finally made it uh so i have um my travels here were interesting i so i like to find the worst in everything because it's just you know i think that's who the you best are as a person life. uh but and i don't travel much so first of all airplane travel stresses me Did out you say bad. that you have a light but you hide it under a bushel I, money bushels i hide it under many bushels um but yeah so i don't travel very much by plane at least and it stresses me out really bad so uh near me uh i fly out of logan airport in boston and about 30 minutes out of boston is a town called framingham and it was they have a shuttle service to direct to the airport called the logan express and you just park there it's way cheaper to park there than the airport and then you just take a shuttle ride to the airport and it's like 30 minutes or should be 30 minutes away it's like a satellite light lot that's 30 minutes away yeah framingham is a pretty big town city thing but a lot i mean boston's like Eastern, well, I guess the Cape counts as uh, Eastern, but either way, it's kind of like it's honestly a pretty good location when given the geography of Massachusetts and where Logan is to other airports and where you'd fly out of. Like, considering there are people... the roads aren't on a grid because the Masons designed yeah. them like a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's clearly <laughs> like if you if you look at it, the winding patterns. It's all a big conspiracy. Yeah, really. An aerial view shows that it's a phallus. That's road what... <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are people on the shuttle who drive from up from Connecticut to go there because that's easier. They're doing an international flight and it's easier to go there than it is to JFK, which is in New York. So there's, it's, it's not a bad location, but either way, I'm not used to it. I leave early enough to get to the shuttle place on time and the, the bus leaves from there every 30 minutes. And I eat, but I pull in and there's a big sign that says the parking lot's full and I instantly like panic and freak out and start losing my mind. So I call my wife. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Everything's going to fall apart. I'm going to miss my flight. And um, I'm driving around trying to figure it out. So she ends up looking it up, uh, trying to give me an idea of what to do. But so I find out there's an overflow parking lot. So I drive to the overflow lot and then I get there and there's no information. So I see all the people waiting for the bus. I'm like, where am I supposed to go? Everyone has these like, papers in their car that say like the date you're parking there from until and they're like yeah you need to go back to the main building so you're just like nervously towing your roller bag around singing like like crying and singing like this little light of mine <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna let it show well i was in my car uh 
So I wasn't towing my roller bag. But <laughs> when I mentioned to the people, when I asked the people like at the lot, they're just like, "Hey, you need to go back to the main building and then pay for the parking and then come back. So then I drive back and then come back and get on the bus. And the person who, I don't, I don't know that I should have an idea of what some bus drivers are like, but actually this lady kind of reminded me of my whole swim lessons coach that I talked about, <laughs> uh, the swim lessons teacher that I talked about a few weeks ago, but she was one of those like overly talkative people where She's trying, it feels like she's trying to engage the bus in a sing-along, but no one's there for it. Like, or, you know, like when your teacher asks like the class a question, everyone just sits there quietly and has no idea what to say. And it's awkward. And like, that's, so that's what she's doing. She's like, so where's everybody going? I don't, is it my turn? I don't want to tell I don't care. I'm not trying to have a conversation with you. The two I people, haven't unspoken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the two ladies up front were these older ladies that felt like they sh- probably should talk to her. And they were going on a cruise. And the bus driver is like, oh, my God. you got If I'm your bus driver when you guys come back, you have to tell me all about it. And I'm sure they're thinking, clearly, let's hope you're not. But And if you are, that's still not happening. I'm going to the very back of the bus. So basically, this, this lady was just nice and outgoing. And that's an anomaly in Boston. Yeah. And it's <laughs> annoying. It's not only an anomaly, but people find it very annoying. <laughs> But I went to, anyway, so whatever, finally get to the airport, everything. I mean, I'm flying Delta. I've never flown Delta. I think I've only flown JetBlue in the past, actually. That's kind of like a spirit sort of airline, right? That's yeah. Like, there's no first class. They, they charge you if your shoes are too wide. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you got to buy extra foot space. <laughs> but I intentionally didn't bring a check bag because I hate checking bags because I don't trust airliners to save my stuff especially because i mean there's an entire website devoted to selling stuff that was part of people's baggage that never made it to them (laughs) so i'm like if you can run an entire website off of this it feels like a very common occurrence that your stuff doesn't make it to where it's supposed to be and then those people maybe they're just that's the other thing if you're not claiming your baggage one you either have too much money and you don't care or two uh, the airport is not telling you that they found your baggage and they're just selling it. <laughs> Three, it's a big duffel bag full of anthrax. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, we found this bag full of laptops. I, we lost your you bag. Just, just you, you just wanted... write Salman Rushdie on the claim tag. <laughs> but anyway, so it's a boxing glove on a spring. <laughs> <laughs> when you open it, it, just punches TSA in the face. One's like, I don't remember having a briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> like do you have any electronics in your backpack and i'm like no and it goes through and they're like we found something we have to open this up and i'm like "Ooh, <laughs> dude the zoomer wave of terrorism when it finally hits is just going to be like them leaving e-cigarettes in their bags and not declaring them yeah <laughs> just hoping that they melt down dude there was part of me that was like terrified that they'd find like drugs in my bag even though i didn't bring any i don't <laughs> The worst always comes to mind. That's why I hate this kind of travel. The worst comes to mind because if anything happens, you missed your flight. And then that's a pain in the ass. But I'm like, this is the bag. This is a small bag that I I bring anytime we travel. And the last place I traveled was to North Carolina. And then we filled that bag. And I definitely put edibles in it. And I'm like, is, I'm like, as I'm waiting in line at TSA, I'm like, what if I didn't take the edibles out of that other uh, the side pocket? And then they find it. And then I have to explain myself. Now, Edibles are legal in Massachusetts. I can walk into any dispensary and buy them. They're, so what happens if you get caught with them there is they call state police and the state police go, you can't bring this on a plane and we just made you miss your flight. So now you put them in the garbage and miss your flight. So it wouldn't be like, it's not like I was afraid of getting arrested or anything like that, but I was just no. like stressed out about it. I can assure you, I know a guy who's traveled with edibles <laughs> in his, <laughs> his bags a lot. His and, name begins uh, with... It ends with AC. <laughs> yeah, you don't know him. But uh, yeah, they're, they're not looking at those. One time somebody was asking me about that. I Because I used to, I spent like three years traveling for the company that I worked for. I traveled like all yeah. over the US, some Canada, once internationally. Not really out of the country very much. But uh, so I, would, I just flew like three times a month. I was on a plane going somewhere or somewhere back. I guess it makes it six times a month. But, uh, you know, 
like you just put things in your bag and as long as it's not uh you know a weapon a carbine <laughs> <laughs> like you're pretty much good but uh i remember somebody being like well i want to bring some stuff back from washington but uh you know, I don't know if I should. And like, what if there's dogs and stuff? And I'm like, okay, but think about that. Like everyone in Washington smells like weed now. Yeah. Like they, everyone there smells like weed. If you're a Labrador, the entire U S population smells like weed save like, I don't know, maybe the Bidens, yeah. <laughs> but I just like trying to imagine like the level of panic that would go off if a lab started like marking people who smelled like weed in an airport. Yeah. The assumption is if like a dog starts barking at you like crazy in an airport, like you're carrying C4. Yeah. I was going to say a bomb. <laughs> Definitely a bomb. Mission impossible stick of gum on yeah. you or something. <laughs> but anyway, my carry on, I intentionally brought a carry on only because I hate checking bags. And then I'm one of the last sections to board and they're like all right now you have to check you're you're too far back in line you have to check your bag so that was really annoying especially when i got on the plane and there was plenty of overhead space i could have put like three bags up there and been fine but they were all panicking and i know why they panic because what they don't want everyone to get on the plane and then not have enough space for their bags and then do the checking and then leave later like i get that there's a lot going on there but as a customer i was annoyed so then I get to my seat. Someone's sitting in it. I had the aisle seat. I prefer the aisle seat because maybe I have to take a piss or whatever. Like I didn't, I, the middle seat's obviously the worst, but the person who's sitting there, I'm like, I think you're in my seat. And she's like, no, this is my seat. And I was like, this says that B is the aisle. And I just decided I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to go. I'll just sit in the window seat. Fuck it. Like it just didn't seem worth the argument. Especially if you sit next to this person for two and a half hours, it, whatever. So I sit down. Now somebody else comes up the line. She looks at the lady. She goes, I think you're in my seat. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. She was in the wrong row completely. So she was supposed to be up. I was in 53 and she was supposed to be in 51. And then the flight attendant's trying to work it out. She's like, well, you're, she, she's supposed to be here and you or where I was. And I'm supposed to be where this lady is. And that lady's supposed to be two rows up the worst. And I'm like, the flight attendant's like, look, you can just to the girl who's like trying to figure out where to sit. She's like, you can just sit right there. Cause that's where she's supposed to be. Or you and her can switch. And then the person who's sitting next to me is like, you don't mind switching. And I just want to be like, I don't want to sit next to you for the next two and a half hours because I'm already mad at you. And now you're asking this person to sit where you're supposed to sit because you sat in my seat, which I wanted. Oh my God, the worst. So that pissed me off. Like, that's what, dude, everybody, like, air travel sucks. It's not fun. No. Unless like, you're in first class. Those people look like they're having a good time. Yeah, first class <laughs> makes it much better. But like... It's not fun, and we're all in the same position. So, like, when you get on a plane thinking, like, yeah, I didn't get the seat I wanted, I'm going to make this an issue. And if we have to sit on the runway for 10 extra minutes so that I can have the seat that I want for two, two hours, you can't just sit down for two hours. Yeah. Like, shut up. Sit in your seat. And you know what? If you wanted an aisle seat, you could have paid the 10 extra dollars yeah. to pick your seat online. We all know what you did. <laughs> like you could have had the opportunity. You had the opportunity to choose to do that. You chose not to. You're like, I'll save $10 and just be the worst on the plane. It's dude. That, that, so like, I remember when they, so there was quite a few airlines that used to have free check bags, like the free first check bag, right? You know, or maybe even yeah. the second one someplace. Yeah, that used to be common practice. Well, and I remember when they like switched that and all of a sudden it was like you had to pay for every check bag pretty much unless you're on Southwest, which is um, everybody's people are polar opposites on that. That's worse than the debate between like Democrats and Republicans is <laughs> like Southwest, fly, Southwest and non-Southwest people. But uh, like they switched this all of a sudden and now everybody's like, I have to put everything I own into a carry on. Yeah, well, that's and, me. And you know what? Your your carry on is appropriately sized, and you did that, and that's mine. Fine. Could have fit under the chair in front of me. Even the guy who wanted to tag it to put under the plane was like the one of the other people who was there was like, "That looks pretty small. I think it can fit under the seat in front of me." He was like, "No, we need to 
we need to check it. And then I get in there and look at the underneath the seat in front of me. I'm like, oh, plenty of room. Well, when they start, when they made that change, like everybody started coming with a carry on, which is, was a problem because they didn't, you know, if it didn't fit into the overhead or if there was too much stuff that people were trying to fit up there, there's not enough room. It's first come first serve. And that's just how it is. Sometimes that sucks, but that's how it is. And like, do people would hold up the plane for like 10 minutes, trying desperately, like walking up and down the aisle. I got stuck behind someone who was trying to do that. And you just want to be like, just like, just check it. Just check it. Yeah. Especially like, and now, now that they made that change where like, if there's not enough room or if it's kind of too big and you probably should have checked, they'll just check it plain side for free. Yeah. Which is what, that's what they did for me. And that's what they did for a lot of people. They're like, we're going to start bring it up now because you're just going to have to get it checked when you're in line now. Like they just decide to call it at some point. They're like, they're not going to risk it. They're just like, from here on out, every person who shows up with a carry on is checking their bag. Whatever. Yeah. It's not ideal. It pissed me off. I brought a carry on to avoid that. I didn't get to avoid it. What also was making me annoyed before I even got on the plane was I was standing for a while. There was like the, the area was full and everyone leaves a seat in between them and no one wants to take the seat in between two people. It's just yeah. feels fucking weird. So I was standing next to a trash can. That was a nice place to stand. And then finally a seat <laughs> opened up and I sat down and then right afterwards it was like a pilot who was waiting to like fly somewhere sat one seat over from me then this other guy shows up and sits down right in between the two of us and immediately proceeds to answer his phone call a phone call and he was talking to his girlfriend doing girlfriend voice which was awful (laughs) and you can know for sure that's not his actual voice and it's girlfriend voice because right after saying oh thank you oh yeah love you too baby Mm -hmm. Uh like that high like they they go up like three octaves and like he's he's talking to like a yorkie yeah (laughs) (laughs) like i was thinking like a small child like you're doing baby talk to a child so he's done with girlfriend talk hangs up the phone and then one of his boys calls him and he bros out so fucking hard like in between me and this pilot like oh yeah bro oh yeah and it's like and then he starts talking about i don't know something they did the night before and like for some reason thinks it's really important to like take this phone call and rehash his party history in front of everybody it's like, dude, if I ever got a phone call in an area like that, I would, if, no matter who it was, it could be the fucking president of the United States. And I'd be like, I'm in an airport right now. I'm not going to be an asshole. <laughs> so that was like set the whole thing up. I'm like, just grinding my teeth. And then they're like, you know, they check you like, oh, gate one, gate two, gate, uh, not gate one, like cabin one, two and three. And they just keep repeating that we're only seating these people right now, the entire area of people waiting to get on, just in line to get on the plane. So by the time I get on the plane, all the people who weren't supposed to get seated until I was had already been seated. Like there's still the entire back of the plane's full. I was one of the like last people to end up getting on the plane at that point, but it was just like, there's no etiquette. No one cares. It's like a fucking free for all in there. Oh, it's terrible. I do not miss flying that often. It just got to a point where like you could tell the people who flew all the time when you were doing that, which a lot of the people in there, you could tell they're like on planes all the time at work. And like those people, I mean, me included, like the second you walk through security, it's like earbuds in and you don't talk to anybody until you get to wherever you're going and see a person, you know, so (laughs) funny, uh, funny story that like, I don't know, you almost have to, it's, it's like hard to remember exactly how things were like right after 9 11 yeah but it was crazy like if if you're a younger person that didn't you know maybe you didn't like live through that or maybe you don't remember it very well like before 9 11 uh you know most of the security things that we have now like none of those existed basically oh yeah you walked through a metal detector they would like i remember like i was a you know my like public facing identity as a as a junior hire was like i'm an outdoorsman i hunt and i fish and i always got a camel belt on you know yeah and so i always had like a pocket knife with me at all times and uh i remember like before 9-11 you would walk through security 
if you had a pocket knife, the security guy would open it up. He would see if the blade was longer than his ID tag. And as long as it wasn't, they would just hand it back to you and you would go through. Wow. So like things changed drastically immediately after 9-11 happened. As I remember, we went on a trip to Colorado, like family vacation. And it took us three hours to get through security in Denver. Oh my like, God. I distinctly remember that as a kid. I mean, we had to, it was like a whole day ordeal yeah. to like go to the airport and stuff. So uh, my dad, you know, at the time he's, you know, running his own business. He, at the time, you know, he didn't have like a warehouse guy. So he did all most of that himself. And I, you know, I did some, I'm, my sister, and my mom did some, but you know, when you're working around a warehouse, like you always have a box cutter yeah. in your pocket or whatever. Oh yeah. So they get on a plane, you know, they're going somewhere on some sort of trip. I think it was a work trip or whatever, but he, you know, throws his jacket on and goes to the airport and going through security, he's got a box cutter in his like breast pocket of his jacket, which that's is, what they used to hijack the plane. Yeah. The, the, the most deadly one. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> you could walk through the airport with a morning star. Like easier than you could walk through with a box cutter at a that Morning point. Star, a Christian bookstore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, Morning Star is like the club with the big spiky uh, ball on the end. We had, I think it was a local thing, but in Massachusetts, uh, we had a Christian bookstore called Morning Star. Weird. Yeah, I think it was like maybe the Star over Bethlehem or something like that. Oh, gotcha. Well, that's much more beautiful than uh, <laughs> you know Roman skull smasher or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, but roman so maybe that's maybe the idea is that that's actually what they used to pierce pierce christ's side just maybe whacked him with a morning star they drove the nails into his <laughs> wrist with a morning star <laughs> <laughs> you, you missed like 40 times trying to <laughs> just <laughs> smash the person's arms to bit <laughs> it's just like Meat flaps with spikes through them at that point. <laughs> you just got beef wings. <laughs> <laughs> Tenderized. Anywho, uh, so he had this box cutter in his pocket and got stopped in security. And at the time, like, there was no, like, okay, well, here, we're going to confiscate that, go on through, or whatever. Like, it was criminal charges if you tried to bring a weapon through oh my god so he he got to go on his flight but he was like had to appear before a court to handle this charge of like what you know i don't know what the charge was or whatever but uh he said that he went to court that day to commit plane hijacking hijacking (laughs) (laughs) play uh, pilot ejaculation (laughs) (laughs) probably my dad's a convicted pilot ejaculator. <laughs> <laughs> but oh my god! He said when he showed up for his like court date, you know, it's like it's a lower court or whatever. But uh, he said there's like four or five other people there with like, similar <laughs> things. They were all on the same flight like, too. What? What? They formed a brotherhood afterwards, <laughs> and then actually went on to hijack a plane. It was really the U.S. government's fault. Like, what are you in for, pal? Like, well, my toenail scissors were a millimeter too long. That's right. I remember people talking <laughs> about that. Like, people having nail clippers confiscated and stuff like that. I think for a while they confiscated nail files. Yeah. Hand sanitizer. Yeah. And well, yeah, you could squirt it with a lighter and yeah. it's like napalm. Yeah. <laughs> it had to be below 70% alcohol hand sanitizer. <laughs> right. <laughs> You can bring that on the plane. The TSA agent tested it by taste. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 65, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, oh, I, I don't know, like, what am I doing here, you know? And talking to, like, the, whatever the person there that was organizing the whole thing, he's like, can I just, like, plead guilty and pay a fine? And they're like, no, oh, no, you don't want to plead guilty. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's a really big offense. It's like Carrie's theory, like it's a felony or something like that, you know? So, oh my God. <clears throat> he got it straightened out, but I, I think he got like automatically screened every time he went through for a little while. <laughs> imagine how sick of that shit judges got. 
Like oh, judges yeah. are like, oh my god, another person who just like forgot they had a pocket knife on them. Yeah, that his fingernails be- were too long. His his cowboy boots were too yeah. pointy. <laughs> <laughs> that was when uh, me and Jesse went to see uh, Tom Segura in New Hampshire, it was uh, he forgot he had a pocket knife on him, and we went through the security there. And the guy who was doing like the checks with the metal detector, or whatever the hand wand one. He was like, oh, do you have to get empty your pockets? And my friend was like, oh, shit. And he took it out. Decent, like a nice pocket knife. And the guy was like, he just like, I'll put it in my pocket. You can come back. If you find me after the show, you can have it. Um, if you don't find me, well, I guess it's my pocket knife now. <laughs> and he was like, all right. And, but Jesse found him after the show. And the guy was like, oh, yeah, shoot. And he gives him his pocket knife back. Dang, that's a cool security guard. I know. I had candy confiscated this week. Yeah. Was, Were you smuggling it underneath your like <laughs> side rolls? <laughs> I should have just left it in my pockets. <laughs> so we went to uh, April and I went to. They pol- had to poli- peel them all off one at a time. <laughs> they you, like, like melted into my chest there. Hard candies. <laughs> <laughs> like you're just gonna have to bite these out now. It looked like they were doing some sort of like sleep study on you, like with all the <laughs> <laughs> sticky pieces of candy. The over your body. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, how was my dad's CPAP machine last night? Uh, yeah, I put it right on my dick, and it felt <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so much airflow. Yeah, I, it sucked me off pretty good. <laughs> it blows i think it sucks <laughs> well you know same thing you just have to put it to plug the tube into the other side. other way it just might need to be cleaned out before your dad uses it again <laughs> <laughs> they're like real dolls you can just put them in get the like dishwasher. a bottle yeah, let's get a bottle brush cleaner maybe <laughs> bottle of rubbing alcohol <laughs> 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 oh yeah so we went to a concert this week we went to see polyphia and unprocessed which was that was really fun i feel like these days i'm kind of like always on the fence about whether or not i actually want to go to a oh, show yeah. there's so many that i think i want to go to but i'm just like i'm not buying tickets because i know the day of i'm gonna be like i don't think i want to do this <laughs> I wish I could just sit and deteriorate at home <laughs> rather than like go out and do something social. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like going through security at the, like at the beginning of the show, you have to empty your pockets and the guy's like, what are those Jolly Ranchers? We can't, <laughs> we can't allow kid. We, we can't allow candy in. And I'm like, just admit it. You just love candy. <laughs> He's like, we can't allow candy in. I'm sorry. They don't have sense of humor. No, he totally. I and then I felt like a douche. Like, oh, this guy thinks I'm arguing with him or something. But yeah, (laughs) because they they sell so many Jolly Ranchers inside, they can't deal with the competition. (laughs) Big Jolly Rancher enforces that rule (laughs) on local businesses. Yeah. (laughs) So, so dude. So I feel like so the the venue that we went to is in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where kansas university or university of kansas whatever it is that's where the campus is so it's kind of like a little hipster strip in the middle of this town it's a Mm -hmm. nice place but um there's a venue there called the granada and we've been to a bunch of shows there it's actually a fun place it's like tiered seating or uh, you know standing area on the way down like so you start at the back and it's higher and then it goes down so usually like we're we're there at an early enough time where there's like four bands playing. So as soon as bands clear out, like there's a handrail that goes around each of the tiers areas. Yep. So if you get, if you stand on that, like right up against that handrail, like you got a great view of everything going on. Well, we got there late this time and there was only two bands on the show. And so that was it. Yeah. It was just the two. Dude, of them. That is my kind of show. It was great. I mean, yeah, like there's part of you that when you hear that you're like, there's only two bands playing. No, but part I of me. loved it. No, it part of me says it like that. <laughs> the amount of times I've like been like, I really want to go to the show, but they put five fucking bands on the bill. Call it a festival and start it three hours earlier. I show up late. Like we usually go late if if it's one of those shows. If it's a show like that and the opener is a band that I really like and want to see, I still I like won't do it. Like the amount of times I've gone to shows where 
I wanted to see one of the opening bands and you just get like a 15 to 18 minute set and you're like, I just paid. Now I have to, it, I might like the headliner too, but I'm like, I like the first band and the last band. So I paid to sit here and listen to stuff that I objectively dislike for two hours before hearing something else that I want to listen to. Yeah. It seems like usually it ends up being like the structure of it is you've got like four or five bands the first two bands you've never heard of. The third band is the one that you really want to see. And you kind of want to see the headliner, kind of, sort of, not really. Yeah. But you feel kind of guilty buying tickets and that not sticking around for more than one band. And the second, like the second to last band is usually like the one that I don't care about at all for some reason. And it's like you just have to sit through their set. Yeah. It's just miserable. Yeah, that's what happened. I feel like getting older, show, the, the whole show dynamic has changed so much. This one was fun. It was very tough to see because uh, Cause you're like a small said, boy. I'm a little guy, and at five six, showing up late to a to a show is not a good plan. This place was packed for these two bands, which are primarily like instrumental bands. I guess this one of like the opener is doing a lot more vocals now, but we got there and like you know belly up to where the crowd's at at the back you know where where we can yeah. reach it and can't see like the stage at all i can see the lights above the stage and that's about it so we like <laughs> slowly wiggle our way through you know throughout the course of that first set you know kind of making our way towards the good spots uh unprocessed stop like ends yeah stuff opens up just a little bit so we kind of like shove our way forward now we're like boom we got a great view of the stage perfect ready for uh polyphia to go on and all of a sudden like we're standing there talking and stuff and all of a sudden i hear like pardon me pardon me pardon me and you know you just kind of instinctively like oh okay sorry you know step out of the way and uh, this guy he was like six foot eight <laughs> he was huge he's like twice your size yeah he looked like Khal drogo or whatever from uh <laughs> that's what he looked like he looked like jason momoa and he's like Jaws. Yeah, he just Who's like the guy who played Jaws and Goldeneye. <laughs> that is a yeah, that was a weird looking dude. Yeah, he was a monster man. <laughs> Realistic monster. But yeah, he just like shoulder taps, hey, excuse me, like it does that move and steps right in front of me. And I mean literally like my back is against or my nose is in the small of this guy's back. Just and I'm totally off blocked his back off. sweat. Yeah, exactly. Like, Smell his ass crack a little bit. <laughs> terrible. Like, that is such a bold move. Yeah. To, uh... If you're that tall, you're relegated to the back. Sorry. Yeah. It's just a disadvantage for shows. Yeah. You, you have an Spencer? advantage in basketball, a disadvantage at shows. You just have to accept <laughs> the balance. It's not my fault if you don't like basketball. You still have to stand in the back of shows. Yeah. I didn't really even get any uh, good, you know, cell phone videos like fuzzy and and that, crinkly that would be the only Facebook. way for you to watch the show is to hold the phone over his head and watch it on <laughs> your phone it's like an electronic periscope <laughs> exactly <laughs> maybe that's what i should do is just start showing up to shows with a periscope oh my god like, one you made out of like cardboard <laughs> and old paper towel rolls <laughs> <laughs> did everybody do that yeah absolutely with mirrors we watched it on zoom pbs kids oh man yeah, I definitely made one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's our, I don't know. What do we do here? It's already, think... We're already half hour in. We have so many things we were going to talk about. I shot a bunch of guns for the first time in 20 years, which is, uh, what else? Um, we had something else to talk about. We went and looked around. Oh, we which, watched uh... a bunch of furry videos on YouTube and wanted to talk about those. There's a Christian furries movement, so that's cool. Yeah, that was fun. Um <laughs> <laughs> we got to see if we can get in touch with one of those people. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's pretty gnarly. It's a world that doesn't make it, it makes no sense to me. I don't think I can pretend. It's like when you know uh, someone loses someone really close to them. And you're like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I can imagine how you feel. And they're like, no, you can't because you haven't lost anyone close to you. And you're like, oh my god, I feel like an asshole. I feel like it's that level of distance between like what furries are into and what I'm into. Extreme like, disconnect. You're just like. I can't pretend to imagine what that feels like. <laughs> yeah. To, say, to put on a foxtail when you wake up and be like, 
everything's okay. I don't get it. There's just certain things that like you can't identify with. It doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make them bad. It's just like you look at it from the outside and you're like, I, I don't get it and I don't think I can get it. Yeah, pretending to is disingenuous. <laughs> pretending to makes you more of an asshole than just not. <laughs> yeah, not to be trusted. I feel like there's a lot of things like that. Like, uh, you know, a person who paints their body for a football game. The Blue Man Group? Yeah, I mean, right, depending on the team. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't get it. Yeah. Like, you see them on TV all the time, and I'm like, I just, I don't. Like, it's just you can't see the appeal of the thing at all. Like, it's it's no. just so foreign to you, you can't understand it. Especially when it's cold. Like, being in Massachusetts, it's like 28 degrees out, and there's shirtless dudes with their bodies painted just screaming their tits off. And it's... Like, holy crap. I can't imagine what it's like to be you. I can't. We live in completely different universes. Probably one of these situations that, like, I can identify with, and you probably, I mean, you can you can definitely see the, like, a White Lives Matter rally. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't get what you guys are on about, but you do you. Look, I'm not saying that they matter more. I'm just saying, but don't all lives matter. Does that make that makes more sense, right? Does that sound a little better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought that cleared things up. <laughs> like saying Kardashian lives matter. Yeah. Like they're do they do. We don't need bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a is that one Kardashians lives matter? No, I don't think so. Uh, hopefully. What not. was one of the? Didn't I just post one recently on our Instagram about something about certain lives mattering? Oh, it was uh. Eternal Lives Matter. It was that church bulletin board or whatever. Oh <laughs> billboard <my God>. outside. <laughs> Eternal Billy. Lives Matter. Church bulletin boards. Yeah. Um, well, furries are out there. It doesn't make sense to me either. But uh, <laughs> I feel like what, what little content, because so like I've been to a lot of Comic Cons because of April stuff. And there's, there's always some furries there. Okay. And. They're always nice. Like, I've never seen a furry, like, throwing a fit or being awful to somebody. They're just kind of, like, they're usually, like, publicly annoying. It's like someone who's... Okay. It's like going to a Renaissance fair. Like, yeah. There's people there that are in character, and they're going to, like, yell in your face because that's what they do. And you know that's going to be there, so, like, you might as well not, you know, make peace with it that it's yeah. going to happen. But they're usually, like, there's... There's one thing worse than furries by a long shot at a Comic-Con, and it's a person in a Deadpool costume. <laughs> and if you've been to one of these, you know what I'm talking about. Like, a person who puts on a Deadpool costume yeah. is going to be so annoying at the, sh at the Comic-Con. Like, he's going to try to form a conga line. He's probably got a sign that says free hugs or free high fives, and he's going to, like, run up to you all comically and try to like slap your hand or something it makes so much sense yeah it's th those are the worst no redeeming qualities there so but if that's your culture we don't support it <laughs> it's the only i don't support deadpool and i will not support everything else is good deadpool, deadpool cosplayers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so there but the you know, furries are always seem friendly it's usually seems like it's at one of those things it's like a younger crowd it's typically seems like junior high early high school kids they really? do a lot of that and yeah and they usually kind of like run around and where do they get the money for a full mascot costume <laughs> just ruining their parents credit score <laughs> <laughs> but i i don't know yeah it's it's one of those things that like it's huge it's a huge like community of people and it's it's amazing that it's that big, but you know, hey, good for you, I guess. These people in particular that were mentioned in the article are are furries, and they're also Christians. And the article was kind of talking about how like they're in this precarious position of like having to hide their fursonas, fursona <laughs> from normies who would judge them, and uh, having to hide their their faith from the furry community because it's a largely atheist and there's a lot of like LGBTQ people in that community, apparently. And there was statistics in the article about like 
the amount of people like that, that identify as atheists and stuff. So they kind of view themselves as like, you know, being undercover in like hostile territory. And if it comes <laughs> out that they're a Christian, they're really worried that they might be doxxed, especially if their views on homosexuality and stuff like that come out. And yeah. it is like the weirdest example of like perceived persecution that's out there. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about it. It was like, because you, you find this odd, I'm going to just call it odd. I don't know, but it's an odd community of people who can only feel like they can be themselves by dressing up and, and full mascot. And you're like, like, that seems like a place where you're not really, I wouldn't think that you're really talking about these kinds of things. Uh, I would think that there's a level of escapism to this. I don't, that's what I don't understand about that world at all. It's like, I would think that really, why I don't, I can't imagine a reason why religion, would, but I guess that means that this group is really all about like, I have to dress like this so I can fully be myself and talk about the things that I want to talk about. But ironically, now I feel like I'm in a place where I can't talk about the things I want to talk about because this isn't, but you found that community because it was open and made you feel comfortable, but now you don't, it's just like. Uninhibited this... self-expression. Yeah. Was, is what, what's appealing about the community so in the first place. And now like, I don't know, you see that group of people as like potentially judgmental or whatever. Yeah. So strange. And one of the quotes in it was funny because uh, it was a guy talking about how he had to, you know, hide his his faith in that in those circles. And the quote was something along the lines of like, it makes me sad that I have to keep this quiet because there are so many people hurting within the fur furry community that, you know, I think uh, Jesus could could help or could comfort or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, there again it's just like like perceived persecution and then this like this like th this need to like make everything a mission field right which is why how evangelicals ruin the real world <laughs> <laughs> you ruin my reality and you ruin my escapism yes I'm real tired of you <laughs> not trying to oppress you right <laughs> this is an open and accepting community but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just funny to see those things played. Like those same tropes played out in this like one of a kind little microcosm of a group of people. There's still this little group here that thinks that like they're being persecuted because I guess because they can't like try to talk you into being like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, why, why else do you would need, it come into play? I don't know why else you need to talk about it in that sphere. Because people need Jesus. Ugh. Furries are hurting. There's foxes and there's dragons. And there's hey, ponies. The foxes have dens where they can lay their head, but the Son of Man has no place where he can lay his head. It's in the Bible. So I don't remember that part. Clearly, <laughs> the problem is identifying with foxes. Was that a direct scriptural I, quote? Yeah. Well, not exactly. I paraphrased. I mean, you remember, like, it's like one the of the last the things in the Bible is says talks about like you know, for those who add to the, I wasn't this adding, word. I was just giving the message for those who ad lib with my words. Hmm. Now you're adding fire. to the Bible and now you are in because ad lib is not in the Bible. So I don't believe in any of this crap. Well, <laughs> the best part about it is your, uh, your lack of belief in it is exactly why you're going to hell. So <laughs> <laughs> that's like the ejector seat for every christian <laughs> exactly. conversation i get into is like go back and forth about bible interpretation blah 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 and like if things get too hairy or you get bored you can just be like well you're not i don't believe christian. in any of this crap anyways so it's neither neither here nor there <laughs> <laughs> i'm out <laughs> oh so yeah um we're gonna see if we can connect with someone from the christian furry community yeah i very interested in learning about that i don't think i it's it's like if we start reaching out to more like fundamentalists or christian people to be on the show like currently fundamentalists i feel like they are not gonna miss an opportunity to talk 
Yeah. Yeah, I think there's an appeal to going into an, like an active war zone for these people. <laughs> <laughs> Just endure some torment. I feel like if any of them did get like wishy-washy about it or something, or some of the people who have bailed on us, you know, like the sleeping giant guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> calling him out now <laughs> i think he could always just be like you know one time there was a guy named jonah and he didn't want to go to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like you're just asking to get sucked down by a car because <laughs> we know it wasn't a whale I, did you know in the original Greek? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the worst. <laughs> was that the sound of you shuddering or coming? I can't. That was just like uh, my my taco, like liquid taco wad, like making it to a bow right here. <laughs> that venison. Yeah. Something else I tried. For the, there was a lot of stuff we were going to talk about. We ran, we ran out of time. We need to introduce our guest. <laughs> A shotguns tried venison for the first time it's only been about 12 hours i've had a lot of new experiences and now we'll introduce our guest <laughs> hashtag uh country life yeah i'm a bumpkin now i watched you comb or brush some burrs off a dog <laughs> that's that's a good like half watch your dog just dive into the creek man yeah. Found some fossils. Catch a frog the size of a manhole cover. Yeah. Saw a spider larger than any spider I've seen in Massachusetts. I don't know what they compared. Silver dollar maybe is a good uh so much magic a lot of experience into There's one. There's a day. lot going on. And we got two more two more full days. So anyway, this is way too long. We went way too long before introducing our guest. <laughs> Hello. All right. Uh, our guest this week is uh, X Ripped Girl Jeans X. That's an Instagram page that we're obsessed with. He's a meme page, uh, and it just dunks on late '90s, early 2000s metalcore. Uh, a lot of that, of course, is Christian because of the overlap, and he did grow up Christian, so he understands that world as best as anyone. And He's just, it's one of our favorite pages. He's hilarious. His memes are all original and they just, every time you look at them, you're like, oh my God. Some that's deep his, cut cultural <laughs> yeah, references. Real deep cuts. So he was a blast. He's super, he's, just, he's, I was like, you never know when you're like, if this is like someone's outlet and they're like maybe reserved or chill or quiet on the other side, you, you don't know for these like meme accounts. And then, but he was so fun, super like, just engaged in the conversation, like all the conversations had a lot of really funny things to say about that world that we came from of like the, just the heavier music within Christianity. And it was so much fun talking to him. Yeah. Great dude. So follow him on Instagram. I'll put a link in the episode description and enjoy our conversation with X ripped girl jeans X. Hey everybody. We are back with our guest, Paul. Uh, you might know him better as the as memeologist. Uh, with he co- he has the uh, X ripped girl jeans X meme page on Instagram, and I'm obsessed with it. I'm absolutely obsessed with the page. Uh, I was just saying before we hit record here that Casey and I and our friend Jesse have a group chat, and we are regularly passing around your scene memes. And <laughs> great, I'm very excited to have you on the show, Paul. Thanks, man. It's it's great to be here. Definitely stoked. I uh, want to reiterate how good the uh, Brian McLaren and the Dogwood interviews were. Those were sick, guys. Thank Thanks, you, man. Yeah. Dude, you uh, before we get into anything real, you had recent. I think one of your more recent posts was uh, for the listeners. I'll try to describe it, but you can check it out. It's um, it's a three children, adolescents, sitting around looking like they're having a serious conversation. And one of the <laughs> captions you have is. Did the chariot only release one good album? And <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I haven't listened to Chariot in so fucking long, dude. But I decided to listen to them today because of that. And uh-huh. the jury, the jury's in. Uh, they do only have one good album. <laughs> <laughs> man, yeah. See, you got to start with the softball question, man. This is the uh, this is controversy right here. Yeah, um, it's funny because I've got a I've got a few buddies that are in that band, and a lot of times I kind of run into that when I make jokes about some of this shit. It's like a lot of times I, I'll actually know some of the people or whatever, and, uh, and oh, I'm yeah. like, 
completely taken the piss out of their band but uh <laughs> yeah but for me you know I, I know a few of those guys they're wonderful human beings but yeah for me it's uh pretty much just that first chariot full length where it's it's all recorded live in one room it's just so chaotic and insane and when they started doing like, actual kind of cleaned up studio recordings it really took it at, took the magic out of it for me personally because the chariot's all about the chaos you know yeah, that's what it's all about sure. it's not really about the music it's about the feeling and uh that that first album definitely has it it's kind of like <laughs> watching stomp on vhs you know <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like this is this is a lot different when it's not in the georgia dome right the blue man group. it's like the blue man group too right you see a little yeah, the blue you don't man see a lot of people like, like, oh, I got, I got the Blue Man Group on vinyl, dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is definitely something that like your boomer parents would buy in the gift shop on their way out of the MGM Grand. Yes. And then like, have you got, have you and your wife over to watch it? And you're like, I, <laughs> is there more dip? I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> you guys have any drugs, uh, yeah. mom and dad? Yeah. I'd watch this high for sure, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I imagine you can't hardly make a joke about scene culture without accidentally poking someone who's been in either the chariot or Norma Jean at one point or another. Right. <laughs> right. Well, it's funny because like I had a I had a meme making fun of Norma Jean. Um, it was essentially the same joke about the chariot. It was a joke about the girl, the little girl from the cover of Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child, suing Norma Jean for getting shitty after that. <laughs> and uh i actually do like norma jean after that album but that album's like of course Same. like tops um but uh i found out a little bit after i posted that that the guitar player for norma jean follows my page which is really, really? <laughs> i feel like this is awesome i feel like it's going to be because you're a fair i feel like you're a newer page or you're just yeah. start, it's like really starting to take off but it's yeah. one of those it's hard for me to believe that it's not going to be followed by a bunch of musicians from the bands that you're just shitting on because people are yeah people are gonna, not shitting on really but like just being goofy definitely with, shitting people, on, are gonna, yeah. people are gonna send those to them and they're gonna tag them in it all the time yes and like you're, uh, i guarantee almost all of your posts if you look through the comments somebody's tagging the official band page <laughs> that that does happen a lot yeah it's funny man because like i've had um i've gotten some follows from like some bands that i'm like oh my gosh like no way you know or at least like the 17 year old paul you know is definitely like pee in his pants but uh yeah <laughs> that's that's pretty cool that's happened a few times and then i've also gotten not a lot but a couple of times it's gotten back to me that like some band was like not amused <laughs> <laughs> which is great too that has to change your opinion of the van because i feel like okay <laughs> what i like about your page is that it, you know there's lots of people that have just like taken a dump on metalcore and stuff like that over yeah. the years you know but it's usually like an outsider perspective where it's like remember slayer when metal was cool oh right and, right like your page is uh it's deep cuts a lot of times yeah. like it it can only yeah. come from somebody who loves it and is like in the middle of it you know yeah oh definitely it's i almost kind of like get off on um just making stuff as specific as possible because it may <clears throat> there may only be a very small amount of people out of the people that follow me that get that specific meme but the ones who do are going to lose their shit because they're like i cannot freaking believe you reference that like five iron frenzy record or whatever it is you know yeah, yeah. um and so that's what i live for because uh like the do you guys remember a page called millions of dead posers no it, no i love the name so there would absolutely be no ripped girl jeans or really probably any of the pages doing this kind of thing without millions of dead posers like several years ago they had a i don't know if they were on instagram they were definitely on facebook and they made kind of scene adjacent memes and they were so funny and i remember just like losing my mind when they would reference stuff that it was even close to my wheelhouse you know um and so I, I think that's like a big part of the fun of it is like yeah. finding stuff to surprise people with. It's like I what what got me thinking that you because a lot of people metal Christian metalcore like was big for everyone. You didn't have to be Christian. You'd have to grow up Christian like that really yeah. took the scene for a while. And um, so it wasn't until I started noticing like 
some of your other uh, references to praise and worship bands or something like that, that I was like, <laughs> oh, I think this guy does have the connection that we're looking for because yeah. some of your, your dunks on Crowder are really funny. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a hand what a handsome man right fellas yeah. <laughs> goat from the muppets that was yeah. my favorite <laughs> dude it's like this motherfucker's probably been married for like 20 years i can't even get a text back like what is going on Jeez. <laughs> funny side note about david crowder did you guys know that he apparently lives in dr pepper's house like the <sighs> dr pepper of the soda <laughs> fame what I mean, there's a re- like a legit dr pepper yeah well it's like uh yeah apparently there was i don't know if he was uh i i the, the specifics are foggy but all i know is that there is a guy it's the dr pepper guy um and uh he he's like founder of the soda or whatever and uh i guess david crowder was like in texas or wherever like looking for his house and then he he toured this house and then at the end of the tour the like the real estate person was like oh yeah although also uh this was dr pepper's house and he's like well i'm buying it like i guess he was like maybe not even gonna buy it but he's like okay i'm buying it i'm gonna live in dr pepper's house (laughs) Oh, weird. <laughs> what a yeah. weird way to read the Soda thing. Baron and General Practitioner, you know. Right. Dr. Pepper. Dr. Right. Peter Pepper, hopefully. Say, I thought you were going to say that he just acquired the house because they thought he was like a squatter and they were just like, oh, I guess it's yours now. <laughs> that too. Probably. You look really homeless. You've been here for a while? He's like, yeah. And they're like, all right, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, turn your ear to heaven. <laughs> he just speaks in worship lyrics. You didn't. You couldn't have been in youth group in the early two thousands and not have been singing Crowder songs. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Dude, so let's let's hear a little bit about you, man. Um, yeah. What pre meme page? Pre professional memeologist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's hear about Paul. Was Paul a youth group kid? Where did you? Yeah. What, what area did you grow up in and stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a Kansas City native. Uh, I've lived in Kansas City uh, my whole life. Uh, isn't one yeah. of you guys from Kansas? I'm from which? Uh, well, I live in Wichita. Oh, dope. Nice. Which uh, Wichitician? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I grew up uh, going to church. I uh, grew up in a very small Southern Baptist church in the country, north of Kansas City. Um, super, super active in that all the way through high school, uh, definitely involved in a uh, youth group heavily and played on the worship team. Um, and then, um, yeah, in college also pretty active in some ministry and stuff too. I went to college in Kansas city. Um, I, uh, was, I was like a worship leader in college, um, pretty, pretty involved in our, like, uh, on, like on campus ministry that we had. Um, and that was kind of funny cause I was in like a metal band. I was doing vocals in a metal band at the time. And so I would do like all of these like extreme vocals or heavy vocals, whatever, like screaming like a couple of nights a week. And then I would also have to have my my voice good enough to lead people in worship one night a week too. <laughs> so yeah, definitely, definitely came up heavy uh, in the church stuff for sure. Yeah, dude, it's so what, what funny. Kind of, what kind of Go church ahead. was it? Yeah, so it was like a, it was Southern Baptist. So it was like hella, hella conservative. Um, you know, very much uh, like Republican. No alcohol. Um, no, what what are those things? And you guys have kind of touched on this. Uh, in your episodes that I've listened to is like where it's very, it may not be so clear what a Christian does, but it is clear what a Christian doesn't do. You know, yep. it's, it's a <laughs> right. lot of, it's a lot of like, well, you, you know, you don't like sleep around and you don't cuss and you don't smoke and you don't drink um, that kind of thing. Pretty, uh, pretty Four pillars. Yeah, absolutely. Thankfully my parents weren't too nuts. Uh, my parents are really good people and I think that they had a little bit more balanced view of things than a lot of evangelical parents did in the nineties. And yeah. so, um, they, uh, you know, secular music was definitely always part of like my life growing up and, uh, and like, you know, just popular culture movies and stuff like that. Thankfully I wasn't one of those kids that like couldn't watch rated R movies or whatever, you know? So, uh, so, I mean, I definitely still had that stuff indoctrinated into me a lot and I've had to kind of like shed that over the years, but, um, 
I was uh, I was able to get her exposed to a lot of, of stuff, a lot of stuff that my friends weren't, you know, because I I had friends that could only listen to like Carmen or whatever. And, yeah, you know, yeah. They, they didn't get to like get into cool shit until they're a little bit older. But yeah, yeah. I mean, were did you Carmen only make one good album? Mission three sixteen, <laughs> dude. I mean, banger, banger. <laughs> Talk about certified He's- hood classic. Yeah, right he's he's more of a singles guy, you know. Yeah, I was just yeah. gonna say, I feel like singles was his jam, and like he, long music videos to go along with them. Mm-hmm. Who's in the house? J C. Yeah, one hundred percent. Were you in uh, public school? Yes. Um, so you I had was... you had some exposure to the real world. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, I was definitely in public school, um, which was kind of a nightmare. Um, in a small town, Missouri, just like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think probably, probably similar, uh, upbringing to other people who make jokes a lot as adults, you know, just like a fucking horrible childhood or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> My home life was good and I was in church a lot, but, uh, you know, definitely wasn't like the cool kid in school or anything like that as a kid, definitely got bullied a lot. And I'm a real short guy. I'm five, six. And, and as a, as a kid, I was like really, really tiny. So I got picked on a lot and stuff. Fellow but, uh, short king. Yeah, yeah. Hats man, off to you. Manlet power. Um, You're kind of the hairy. <laughs> it's like the hairy Casey. It's kind of what's yeah. going on over there. I'm a, I'm full moon Casey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I'm just wolfing out. I like it. <laughs> what's, uh, what year did you graduate high school? I graduated uh, high school in 2005. Okay. Make, so that's making, the same making year me as... Uh... 57 years old. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 36 36 yeah what's well, so what is like popular culture at school i mean are these like new metal kids country kids like oh right right yeah so uh when i was like in junior high and high school um new metal was definitely huge this would have been you know 1999 into the early 2000s so like corn and slipknot and stuff that was all really big with like the the skater kids or whatever and yep. then um the like the popular kids were all like really into like rap and stuff um and then of course yeah we had a major major redneck scene the hicks in my high school they were like super into like you know arena country and that shit yeah. um, i uh, my pipeline was definitely uh like sixth grade or so kind of discovering music for myself and like i got really into kiss i was like obsessed with kiss i thought they were the greatest oh. band. <laughs> but they were like, so in good. like you know 1997 or whatever that was the heaviest thing i had ever heard in my life you know it was like detroit rock city or whatever and i'm just like oh my gosh you know um and then and it's uh, so funny listening to kiss because it like you hear it Cause growing up and you first see it and you're like, Whoa, those guys look crazy. And then uh, like you hear it and you're like, this is just like pop. It's so music. Shitty. I mean, what the fuck is this? It's pop. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like a classic version of that. Like, uh, cause people always say this about Slipknot too, where it's like, they look like serial killers and then you listen to it and you're like, these guys are pussies. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. These guys but... make me want to push my fingers into my ears yeah 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 for sure <laughs> did you hear um, okay i'm gonna derail us real quick slip that yeah. put out a new song and it's whew, really bad like truly oh awful. really oh my god i mean i don't know maybe people still like that and one of my friends said it's not nearly the worst thing that Slipknot's put out in recent years but i heard it and was like jesus christ how did they make this Ooh. That, that, uh, I don't know. I, I am no like person to be a good litmus test for Slipknot. Um, a huge amount of my friends are just, just love that band. A lot of people whose music I like really, uh, respect their taste. They're super into them. I don't know, man. Back when I was into new metal, even like I, I just never got. I never got it with Slipknot. Honestly, I liked Mudvayne better than Slipknot. And Mudvayne's like <laughs> kind of lame. But I was like, at least this is like heavy. I don't know. I could never really like get into it. I, I think they're great showmen and everything. But yeah. Slipknot was one of those bands that, so I didn't get into them either. Um, but same. I have friends who were all like, who were really into them. I think part of why I didn't get into them is because like, I mean, you can't, no doubt that they were like, 
you know, path pavers for a lot of people. Right. And yeah. I feel like I found it late enough where they had, they were almost big enough where it didn't feel cool enough to, it, it wasn't obscure enough to like when I was starting to get into obscure music. Yeah. And if I'm going to be like really honest, that's probably part of why I didn't really give them a fair shake. But yeah. then there have been times where I've heard some of their older music come on and I'm like, the shit slaps. It's like yeah. very like, I mean, the, the choruses are fucking fire. Yeah. And it's like just catchy. Like I wouldn't hear it and be like blown away, but I'm like, oh, I could get into this. And then uh, Sam's musical gag reflux doesn't always like make sense either. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, him things sometimes thinking like, but, oh, Sam will like this. And then he's like, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think, it's, a, it's a total dom move yeah no no yeah no. it's it, yeah. you just okay casey let's talk about the shit you've sent me though because let's you know that you've sent me some weird stuff yeah have you sent him some yeah. like dm ghost main let's talk about ghost yeah. main oh holy shit ghost main. you know what's funny is that i've uh i've ripped on him i've ripped on that guy a few times and uh to my complete shock that's like one of the things that people get pat, like really pissed about is if when i make fun of ghost main oh, really <laughs> Yeah, people, he's got a dedicated fan base. Yeah, it's probably because yeah, he's great. Yeah, people are people are like, oh, you know, you're you're crazy for this one, dude. Or this is like a goofy take. I'm like, first of all, welcome to my meme page. Yeah, all my it's takes go- are goofy. That's goofy the point. take <laughs> HQ right here. Secondly, like, what the fuck? This is like black metal for juggalos. Like, what? <laughs> <on earth?" laughs> and it's like, it's like if you like that sick that's awesome but like you know <laughs> buckle up for people to like shit on it though you know <laughs> this should not be surprising that the guy who makes fun of everything makes fun of ghost main <laughs> you posted his logo over ghost man from uh yeah. work and i'm like is yeah. this made just for me like <laughs> that one was for you man i had you in mind dude you know mudvane <laughs> whenever mudvane comes up it makes me think of this guy with a, a wallet chain that used to tell me my games weren't worth anything at GameStop in Howell, Michigan. <laughs> and yeah. He had this symbol on his hand. So when he's like shuffling through my, my pile telling me it's worth 20 cents, I was like, what's a, what's that symbol, that tattoo that you've got? And he's like, uh, it's a mud vein logo. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Are you, you into them? And he's like, not anymore. <laughs> that's awesome that's so sad it is. <laughs> i'll never forget it that's like 25 years ago now <laughs> <laughs> not after the accident <laughs> what Dude, bands that have uh bands that made their their name into a logo that everybody would recognize that was i feel like there's a like cky right you see the cky yeah. and you're like oh yeah Slipknot is definitely kind of one of them, but what definitely. was the Mudvayne logo? It was like an M. It yeah. looked like one of those, uh, yeah, you know, one of those S's that you draw in your notebook with like the the three D S, <laughs> the cool you know? S. Yeah, it was like six lines, and then okay, yeah, it's like that except an M. Okay. I couldn't yeah. draw it. <laughs> I'm sure one of those dudes drew it on his like five star notebook at school or whatever. Yes. This is the logo. for sure. Yeah. All right. So now that I derail us a little bit, uh, your entry into music was Kiss. Take us away. Oh, from yeah, there. yeah. Uh, how, that was. I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I know. I was just like, how do you get from Kiss to finding. Yeah. Uh, no. So I. Uh... Yeah, so I started getting into shit like that. I mean, I was into music as a kid. I was really into like the Beatles and Beach Boys and stuff as like a little guy, but like I. Uh... I started getting into metal and stuff, uh, started playing guitar, taking an interest in that. And then of course that immediately led me into new metal, got super into that for a couple of years, you know, rocking the Jinkos and, um, you know, listening to Deftones yes, and porn and all that stuff. And, um, I was really into that. And then my freshman year of high school. So this is 2001. Um, my, uh, my best buddy, um, burned me a copy of throwing myself by Ludacris, um, which is 
pre Norma yes. Jean, Norma Jean. Um, so he was like, dude, you've got to hear this. This is like different than anything else. And so I started listening to that. Um, it took me a while to, to get a taste for it, but I would listen to it all the time. And then, um, Around the same time, I got a copy of The Hammering Process by Living Sacrifice. And for that, That's that, was, a good one. that was the point of no return for me where I was like, oh, like, holy shit. Like, there is this music that is so much heavier and so much more interesting than um, what uh, is being played on MTV2 or whatever. And like, uh, and then the fact that they were Christians and that they had these like really awesome lyrics and stuff. It was just like there was no turning back. So yeah, I, I was a freshman in high school, probably around 2001. And that's uh, the same time I started going to hardcore shows. My, uh, my dad would like drive me into Kansas city and like drop me off at hardcore shows and stuff like that, which I, I, to this day applaud my dad for that. Every once in a while yeah. I'll bring that up and be like, dad, thanks for driving me into the hood and like dropping me off at some scary like basement or whatever. <laughs> so I could see whatever <laughs> band, you know, like, it's, it's really awesome because I got to see some really cool acts like kind of early on in their careers and stuff like that. Yeah. How did you find out about shows when, at that point? So, yeah. So um, my uh, my best buddy at the time, uh, well, he's still my best buddy. Um, he uh, his family was really involved in ministry. Like his dad was a, was like a domestic missionary. Like he worked at church camps and um, did a lot of youth ministry stuff. And so their whole family they were like one of those like uh like ministry families i almost want to say where like uh you know they they were really plugged into a lot of like the cool christian culture and so it was kind of like through my friend and through his older brother and stuff um i started finding out about these shows and and tagging along to punk and hardcore shows and of course emo and like all of that stuff yeah okay cuz i i mean i remember the I mean, I guess I had the internet, but I didn't really, I wasn't looking up shows. So like the first heavy show that I went to was because I, I saw it that it was coming up in like the newspaper. I'm pretty sure. It was like, Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's uh that's something that's probably not going to happen much anymore for young kids. Yeah. That's crazy no kidding. And it's because it, it normally wouldn't have made it. Uh, the venue near me is called the Worcester Palladium and mm-hmm. that's where anyone. Uh, so we have, we had near me, if you, I'm in central mass. So if you want to drive Mm -hmm. into Boston, you know, big acts go to play shows in Boston. Um, And a lot of those bands now play in Boston. But when, you know, when I was in high school, it was like in the city near me, you had, there's like two venues. There was the Palladium and then there's a, uh, I think then it was called the Centrum maybe it's the Mm -hmm. DCU center now for anyone who's around and knows what I'm talking about. But that was like the arena, the Centrum or DCU Center. And that's where like any pop band or anyone big enough would like come and play through there. But the Palladium was where all the metal and hardcore. Nice. And I, it was a big enough show because I, it was like the, Atreyu was the headliner. And mm-hmm. I think Atreyu was the headliner. And they were really like hitting big. They were hitting their stride at that point. And um, yeah. For some reason, that one made it into the paper, and I read it. And was like, "Holy shit, I have to go to this!" Because it was had um, Norma Jean, Scars of Tomorrow, and Unearth were playing that show. So it was nice. like, oh, I, I "Scars have to, of Tomorrow." I have yeah, to go to holy that. shit! And that's the only show I ever went to there where it it sold so many tickets that they had an upstairs and a downstairs mm-hmm. like area. So the upstairs shows are always for like you know much smaller bands. Downstairs there was like seating, and then there was a like they, the upstairs where they would do shows, if they weren't having a show there, you would go, that was your entryway to the balcony. And that mm-hmm. was the only show I've ever had to sit in the balcony because they had so many people on the floor there just wouldn't let anyone else down there. Damn, dude. And, yeah, like no. um, we, the shows, I was really lucky because um, these were more like usually very intimate affairs, these like shows. They We had a venue at, uh, has not existed for many years now, but in the early two thousands, uh, in Kansas city, we had a venue called the new earth and it was in uh, it was in the basement of a, of a church in the middle of, uh, of, uh, Westport, which is kind of the arts district of downtown Kansas city. And, um, so it was like a pretty small, like carpeted basement and, uh, got to see some great bands there. I remember one of the first shows I went to, 
uh, we were there to see this band called Society's Finest. That was a uh, it was a hardcore band that was like kind of an early um, early ish solid state band. And uh, so we're there to see Society's Finest, and then um, I think it was Azale Dying's first national tour, and they were the wow. opening band. Wow! Yeah, so none of us knew who Azale Dying were, and they were fucking incredible. Um, and we were all just like, "Oh my god! Like, who is this band? Like, we came to see Society's Finest, and they were great, but like, who is this band? You know?" So it's like I got to see Azale Dying as this like opening act in a basement. You know, there That's were a lot so of sick. things like that. Did they um, murder? They did. They did murder. They did murder. I said as I like dying, right? I didn't say. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. In my head, I was like, "Wait, did I say Black Dahlia murder? That'd be way off." You know, yeah, as, I, as, I, as I think you were trying to make a Tim Lambesis joke on that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. They uh, they proverbial proverbial. They basically hired a hitman <laughs> to kill everyone in the crowd. Basically. There we go. <laughs> I saw no. them like uh, two weeks ago. They were here. Oh no, shit! Yeah, yeah. it was kind of fun. I forget who opened for them, but it's like basically Tim Lambesis and one of the guitarists. So that was the only people from the like the classic lineup. Oh, holy shit! That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Man, one that... of the guys was like, "Well, the the bassist just quit. Mm. The one that does the clean vocals for him and stuff. Mm-hmm. So he just quit and joined Spirit Box." And then I don't know. They seem like they just had like a big falling out with each other lately. Can't imagine why. Yeah. No, it's so hard uh, to weird. imagine. <laughs> Man, that whole thing is crazy. Um, I obviously make fun of Tim all the time in my memes, but the reason I rip on that all the time is just because, man, what a fucking like heartbreaking situation, man. Like, I because it's like yeah. I don't even know how else to process that but to joke about it because it's just so crazy. Talk about you know being connected to people. I don't know Tim personally, but like two of my close friends are close friends with Tim. Um, and I remember when all that stuff came out, they were, it was just like, they were in complete shock, you know? Oh, yeah. um, it's just, it's just such like a, such a fucked up situation, man. I, I think like that, the, the Tim Lambesis stuff for me, it really does help me to like be able to make fun of it all the time. Cause I just, I have no idea how else to like deal with that information. Even now, like years yeah. later, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you know, cause that guy yeah. was like my hero, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. That he was, was a the central figure. If you, yeah. if, if for anybody who doesn't know the story, there it was like I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, mm-hmm. Tim Lambesis, who More had been that, as it really be like at this seven point, seven or eight now. Well, he did yeah, seven maybe. years, and he did seven years in prison, I believe, because that was the that was the minimum in California. So he got caught in like a sting sort of operation where an uh, uh, undercover cop approached him about putting a hit out on his wife, and he took the bait. Was, all for it. He said that sounded dope. Yep. And he brought him money and all that and got busted. So it did get a little convoluted. Look, I'm not making excuses for Tim. I'm just, <laughs> but like it got weird because like the transcript of it was like, I can, it was like one of those, I can take care of it situations. And you're like, this yeah. is so fucking weird. It was like, you know, I'm actually, I am a little bit surprised that he got convicted. Not that I don't think he should have, but. I am a little yeah. surprised it happened because of all the the setup. It felt a little like, yeah, inter- Like I felt like you could have weaseled your way out of that. Maybe if he spent another like 10 K on his lawyer or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. His parents are hella rich though. Uh, I, I can't oh, yeah. remember like why I know that I, this is all the useless information I have. Right? <laughs> I just make memes, but yeah, no, his parents are like loaded. So, I'm, uh, but yeah, you think it with nothing else. He's like a famous dude. Of course he's like a rich white guy, you know, right. like, yeah, it's kind of surprising that, but he did only do the minimum. You know, um, it's that's the first time law enforcement's ever used that tactic on someone who's not a uh, a young Middle Eastern male. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a historic <laughs> moment for the United States. Absolutely. First. Number one. Yeah. <laughs> Let you. So you mentioned seeing them in a church basement. And I think it's look, as all the shitting we do on american christianity and evangelicalism on this podcast yeah it's possible that the greatest contribution that they've made to our country 
is the fucking scene. <laughs> right, man. That is – you could make it a, a beautiful case for that because I, I think I think you might be onto something there. Yeah, I mean between – cornerstone music festival um and all of the different churches that were hosting shows and things like that um were willing to kind of tolerate some very uh challenging art uh for the sake of winning souls you know um uh yeah you, you, you gotta give it up to the uh evangelicals at least for that at least for uh being willing to host so many of these shows because there are there's a bunch of those crazy some of them mega churches or tiny churches or whatever that were hosting some pretty crazy shows. And a lot of times, uh, I don't know about where you guys live, but I remember in the mid and late two thousands, especially going to a lot of church shows where there would be non-Christian bands on the bill, or maybe, maybe there would be no Christian bands on the bill. Like, you know, see like Acacia strain or something at a church. It was crazy. Yeah. I feel like they, they, yeah. Like Christian culture as a whole, like, they were just supportive enough of it because they were too supportive of Christian rock where like <laughs> they kind of like sterilized it and they promoted like the yeah. goofiest bands and they put together those big, like terrible tours. Do you ever yes. go to one of those in youth group where it's like cease rock, rock. rock. It's like <laughs> one rap guy, one pop punk band, uh, like a praise type band. And then one actual like, christian rock band and none of them made any sense together and it was yes. always like stadium seating uh-huh. and it, was just, it was like i think my first concert that i really went to that was fun was a skillet show which, yeah boy what a turn <laughs> they've taken but yeah. uh I, I remember it being so much fun and it was like a church hardcore show almost where it was like no no chairs it was an open flooring everybody was moving and dancing around and, and yes you know, doing the like pogo jump up yes. and down Absolutely. and it was so much fun it was like from that point forward i was like i want to be in a band so bad yeah and then every concert i went to for years after that i'd be like so excited about it and then we would get there and it's like it's basically like a, a youth group activity night where, you know, there's pizza at the back of the room and then everybody yeah. like goes down. Some of the bands play songs with hand motions to them that the crowd does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's oh sock puppets in between. Every oh, God. move I make, I'm making you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm setting off some people's PTSD right now, I think. <laughs> Worship songs, I got to cool it. No, uh, I... In the, this was a, some years ago. I was I was doing vocals in a death metal band, and um, and we played a show at a church in Kansas City. And uh, th- there were some shows that we got booked for that we were like, no one is going to like us. Like absolutely no one is going to want to watch us. And we were totally right. We we show up to this church, <laughs> and uh, there was one other band that played, and they were a lot more of like a mainline Christian rock band. And then. Um, there were like, I don't know, there were like a couple dozen people there. They were all like members of that church with their like young children and stuff. There were like all these like six and five year olds like sitting cross legged like on the floor in <laughs> yeah. front of us while we're setting up. And it was just like, but we knew that that was going to be the case. And I remember it was, uh, it was freezing outside. There was a real bad blizzard uh, that day. And, uh, it was like, no joke. It was like negative 10 outside. We all showed up to the show, um, dressed like swimmers. Like we were all wearing like tank tops and, uh, swim trunks and had like, (laughs) you know, the thing where you put too much sunblock on your nose. So it's all white and stuff like that. (laughs) I had my hair tucked up into a, uh, into a skull cap and I had goggles on and we just did this whole beach theme thing. And man, that crowd, uh, it was it was amazing because they could not have been less into it, and then they were so confused by what was <laughs> happening, and of course didn't think it was even remotely funny, which to us just made it so much funnier. <laughs> you got to you got to make the most of those situations, you know. Yes, I love it. I, shows like that are, are always. It's, I would well when Casey was in uh, a band, we, were, we Casey and I met in college, so I would go to like. You guys would occasionally play ones outside the area of Liberty and uh, do some like youth group shows or something like that. And I just a few of the ones that I remember going to was just like they were at least into it, but it has that like awkward vibe where you're like, I don't know if this is 
the Shit, right I know trip. exactly which one you're talking about, too. Yeah. I remember we rode in the bus on the way up there. Yeah, because like we tried to do that thing where you something. put a condom out the window and fill it up with air is what we tried yeah, to do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you get a bunch of like young Christian guys together, you're gonna oh, yeah. get some of the weirdest shit going on. I, it's it's great. You, that repressed I, horniness comes out somewhere, and it's usually you, like very strange, right? I mean, it gets it gets insane, dude. Lots of weird dick <laughs> stuff and and mutual mutual nudity and all all that good stuff. Christian <laughs> dudes are the weirdest dudes on the planet. Like, Fact, and, dude. uh, and I will stand by that statement, man. It's, uh, but it's great, man. You meet some super crazy people <laughs> that way. <laughs> yeah. Definitely had a couple of like shocking instances of that. Cause mm-hmm. my, my group, youth group and stuff was so uptight about everything. And like, we went to like a college for a weekend thing at a Christian college in Michigan. My buddy and I did. Yeah. And we know more than like get there and find the room that we're staying in. And one of the guys who was hosting us is like, well, yeah. it's naked homework time. And he just like <laughs> strips naked and sits down and starts playing, you know, doing his homework. And then he's like standing there talking to us and kind of waving himself around. And like, <laughs> we were mortified. I think that was the first time I'd ever gotten like a real hard Boner. straight in the eye look. <laughs> yeah, a real hard, a real hard something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i God. worked right. um i worked at a um church camp for a summer as teen staff and so it's like 20 dudes living in a cabin for three months and it was just like completely off the rails insanity constant constant nudity constant just like weird <laughs> weird shit going on it was great. definitely i think it shaped my humor a lot for better or for worse yeah right. <laughs> it's an accountability group mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely all right paul so all right we left off with you started going to shows I, you mentioned the whole shows in the church uh mm-hmm. that's high school still so you are in high school you find your way into metal and have in hardcore and you did mention that you didn't really seem to fit in in high school. Take it. Well, there wasn't a lot of kids at your school. Like, was that a scene? Was that blowing up? Did you find like a squad? Um, myself and the girl I was dating at the time, like were the scene in my high school kind of seemed okay. like uh, we were the, like the two scene kids. That's not entirely fair. There, there were a hand, there was like a couple of close buddies of mine in my grade that were like into that kind of stuff. But yeah, there was only like, a couple of scene kids uh in my high school by the time i was like a senior there was maybe eight of us in the whole school you know that like kind of wore girl jeans and like were into that stuff um but uh but yeah that was it was definitely pretty non-existent my town was really small and our high school had like less than a thousand people in it so like um yeah it it was just like a really small town we had to you know I, in the town I grew up in, we'd have to drive, you know, 15 minutes to, to do anything. We'd have to go to the next town over to go to Walmart or like rent a movie or anything like that. So, um, so yeah, a very small group of people that were into it in high school, but like my whole life was going to shows pretty much, um, you know, just going to shows like every weekend, a lot of times on weeknights. And at that time there were just all those bands, all those early solid state bands and all of that were just constantly yeah. on tour. Um, so I go to Cornerstone every summer and then um, just go to shows as often as humanly possible. I was really, really, and then my friends and I ran a zine in high school where we would like do reviews of hardcore albums and stuff. And my buddy uh, Antonio who started that, he, uh, he actually got it set up as like a 15 year old kid. So that like, solid state and like trust kill and all these different record labels would send us albums before they came out so we could review them. really it was like the coolest that thing. had to feel of course, great as a kid that would be amazing yeah it was tight like i remember getting to going to see zeo for free on like uh photo passes and like getting to stand on edge of the stage with my like slr camera and snapping pictures <laughs> of zeo back in the day and stuff it was just like yeah it was a really cool feeling Bro, I just got a fisheye lens. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Was the atmosphere all like pretty Christian for you still, even in school or? Um, 
like I, so I was super, super involved in, uh, in evangelicalism at the time I was super involved in ministry and all that, but I always had a lot of friends that weren't believers. I think like a problem with a lot of that culture, one of many problems is that people don't, uh, like they just kind of stick to their own crowd, but I don't know. I, I always had a lot of friends that didn't believe what I did. Um, most of my friends that were in the scene weren't Christians. Um, and it was awesome because those bills at the time, you know, you might go to see a Christian band, but, um, there's a bunch of non-Christian bands touring with them. And so I got to be exposed to like tons and tons of great, uh, secular hardcore live. Uh, and that goes for everything, emo and like all of that stuff. Um, yeah, so I, uh, a lot of my like closest friends weren't, so I, I had a pretty good experience in a lot of ways. Um, people knew like, oh yeah, Paul's like, Paul's a Christian and he doesn't like swear and he doesn't drink or anything like that. But, um, but, uh, I was definitely down to clown with, uh, all the crazy. Yeah, dude, that was very much my exact same experience. Yeah. Most of my friends said I was, all my friends, except for one that were in that were in that music world weren't christians and me and my friend jesse we didn't swear we didn't we started smoking sometimes you know it's okay it was just like occasionally with the guys Uh Uh, you come up with all your little excuses when you need to and then you start swearing a little bit more and but either way like we were like christian kids everyone was it's fine i always think back on that because everyone was like cool with it and it wasn't a thing uh right and and we would talk about those things a lot too, like the differences in our beliefs. And I don't know, it was really, it, it was always a really accepting group. Uh, that's awesome. I found. And I think that's what was cool about it for me. It was like, I, that was the first time I felt like I found a group that I belonged to yes, really. And yeah. then for them to just be like, Oh, it was like, you were taught so many things about what the world was like and how they didn't mm-hmm. like Christians and shit like that. And then you're like, Oh, these are the, these people actually really like me. And yeah. even when I'm a little bit annoying about it, or I try to be a little preachy, they're just like, that's just Sam. That's cool. Like he's a good guy. And like, th- no yeah. one fucking cared, even though I was probably annoying sometimes about it. And I think that's so sick. Yeah. I think that, I think the burden is on Christians a lot of the time and maybe they don't realize it. Um, but the burden is on Christians to be cool because, um, other people a lot of times are going to be cool about it. Yeah. Even even the people that you really think are not like the band that I used to play in was a Christian band. And, um, I remember we, uh, we played in a bar opening up for this band called Fallujah, who's like really big now, which is funny to think about, but we played in this like dive bar opening up for Fallujah and like we're this Christian band and like every single Fallujah shirt has like an upside down cross on it and you know, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, I was all nervous, you know, cause like, and not very many people were at the show and I was like, Oh man, am I going to talk about Jesus on stage? You know? But, yeah, I'm going to do it. You know? And so I did it and stuff, even though I'm like taught essentially just preaching at these guys in this band, you know? Um, and, uh, but like, it was so funny and I didn't say anything crazy. I was just like, we love Jesus or whatever. But, um, I remember after the show, like them coming up and being like, oh man, you guys are so good. Like, do you want to like trade merch and stuff? And we like traded merch, even though like they had all this like upside down cross shirts and stuff like that. <laughs> like I remember the drummer for our band got one of the shirts with like an upside down cross on it. And he's like, oh, it's cool. Peter was crucified upside down. I'll just like say that's what it was or whatever. But <laughs> But yeah, I think the burden is on um, on believers um, to be cool. Um, I think people are largely like down to to be buddies and be cool. It's just that Christians mess it up a lot of the time because they yeah, make it for weird sure, or they turn people into projects or whatever instead of just being like a friend. Right. The biggest irony, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, like back then and then now, if you have one. Mm-hmm. I feel like there was always a, like at any given time, there was kind of a, a band that was like the epicenter of cool at yeah. the time. Like it was just like everybody liked them. Everybody was talking about them. It was like a big deal to like them. And so you kind of like forecasted it around and stuff like that. Like, do you remember any of those from back then? 
and then like who do you who do you see that way now if you have any oh cool well um back then definitely norma jean that first uh uh norma jean titled album you know um bless the martyr that that was a game changer i still think that's one of the most incredible albums in any genre that's ever come out um that um those guys for sure i was super obsessed with zayo still am um living sacrifice i was like way into them at the time beloved is one of my favorite bands of all time yes um yeah super super good you guys one of you guys mentioned beloved in the uh dogwood episode and i was like yeah when i was driving i was like Woo, yeah. <laughs> I, I made the trip from massachusetts to uh north carolina to for their hometown show Oh man, I had a couple of friends uh, drive out from Kansas City uh, to that. Uh, or are you talking about their? Which show are you talking about? The one that the, happened a couple of years ago, or the one in the like two thousand like last October or whatever? Oh okay, um, yeah. I didn't have anybody I knew go to that one. I don't think, but um, a couple of my friends in two thousand four, back when they broke up, they did a a final show in North Carolina. I think okay. And, uh, had a couple of people drive out there. I remember it, dude, this is so funny. The way I like gauge years is like when I think of 2004, I'm like, Oh, 2004 is when beloved broke up. So like, yeah. <laughs> I'll like think about when some movie came out or some big world event. I'm like, okay, so that happened after beloved broke up. Okay. <laughs> that that's my reference. Cataclysmic <laughs> event for you. I love that. Yeah. As far as, um, as far as right now. So I can't pretend to be like super duper plugged in with like what the, what the young kids think is like the coolest thing right now or whatever. But um, to me, I think the most interesting stuff that's coming out in heavy music um, is uh, my favorite. I think my favorite band making heavy music right now is fire tools. Um, It's a uh, one woman band from Chicago. um, And uh, it's absolutely fucking nuts. You guys should definitely look it up, but yeah, fire dash tools with a z at the end um it is a one woman um black metal slash shoegaze slash jazz edm thing it's this big kaleidoscope of sounds but she makes it work uh it's incredible i was like a big fan of her stuff and then she actually ended up following ripped girl jeans and so we've ended up becoming good friends which is crazy um so sick but um not easy for the average person to get into. I get it, but I think Fire Tools is making the most interesting heavy music right now. And then uh, I think also uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of a band called Chat Pile, but they're phenomenal. No, um, Chat Pile, Chat Pile. So, do you guys like Me Without You at all? Oh, absolutely. He yeah, does. Me Without You is one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, yeah. Same. So, Chat Pile is if you take like early me without you where it's kind of like spoken word hollering over like kind of messy hardcore music it's like that but mix it with like a bunch of meth and like make it like (laughs) make it so every instead of being themed off of like spirituality everything is themed off of like just like the nightmare of living in like you know like serious trailer park oklahoma kind of stuff (laughs) Kind of like a, uh, <laughs> all right. What's the, what's the guy's name? Ah, oh, God, the country guy that sings all the like, uh, I'm on pills and life is hell. God, he's the, the third. Oh, Hank the third. Yeah. Hank yeah. the third. That's the yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like in a Hank the third, um, like headspace sort of with like Meets a little mud bit vein. of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a country um, version of Stitches. Did you guys fuck with Stitches for a second when he had his, uh, I don't remember Shit, Stitches. Pop up on YouTube. I don't remember oh Stitches. God. I don't think he was that big, but he was just like oh, every song he has is about. It's just like he's a white guy with like he's with the uh, his he's got the tattoos coming out the corners of his mouth of stitches. He's got like tons oh, of face tats and shit. Edgy. And, uh, it's bad. It like I mean, it's truly logo. awful music. But that was the first <laughs> thing that came to my mind when you, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first thing that came to my mind, Casey, when you started talking about whatever it is you're talking about, but not country. But anyway. Anyway, so that's that's my plug is look up fire tools and look up chat pile and uh, and I understand if nobody likes it, but I think <laughs> but I think it's very very cool. <laughs> I feel like that was always a part of that music scene, though. Is uh, yes, like some music had a high barrier to entry, and yeah, that yep. was part of why you wanted to like it so bad. Yes, like yeah. 
<laughs> definitely a watered down version of that. But I feel like that was that was the chariot. Yeah. Like I didn't really listen to the chariot a lot, like a devoted listens like I did to other bands. But I kind of wanted people to think I liked the chariot, sure, which is man. super lame. <laughs> oh, dude, I was the no lamest. Way. I still am. No, yeah. Uh, I mean, the chariot was all about that electric live show. They were absolutely insane live, and it really did feel like the songwriting was like maybe third priority, maybe lower on the list. <laughs> but it was all about that, it, which is fine. You know, it was, it was just all about that feeling live where it was just so crazy and unhinged. Dude, one of my favorite bands that I loved in high school. And I still listen to, but one of the few that I still go back and listen to, they haven't been around for quite a minute. And I bring them up to people occasionally. And a lot of people are like, I don't, I don't really remember them or they didn't really fuck with them at the time. Dude, everybody knows yeah. Lincoln Park. And I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping that you do. And I think there's a chance you might. So we'll see. You ready? Yeah. All right. From a second story window. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Hell yeah. Woo. From a second story window is amazing. I, I needed actually... this. I did a really stupid half-assed meme of them not too long ago. That was um, oh shit, I missed it. Have you seen that format where um, people put that like porn star girl's face that's like moaning on things, and they'll put yes. in the word "cum"? Uh, yeah. yeah so, I did, <laughs> so I did "cum" a second story window, and I put her face on all of their faces, and then I really, really shittily put them in front of like a two-story house, and then I found a picture of spraying champagne foam online and took just the just that white foam like spewing towards the camera and had it coming out of the like w second story window like kind of at the camera <laughs> That's i want to see it it sounds like a labor of love uh absolutely i mean like anything i do it's a veritable sistine chapel on your phone screen um but uh <laughs> But yeah, uh, I, I fucking love From a Second Story Window. They were great. They were absolutely oh, so crazy. Good. And I think their last album was the best thing they put out, and then they didn't even tour it. They just fucking broke up afterwards. That's and a total Giga me. Chad move right there. Man. Yeah, They're right? Like, yeah. It was rough. Yeah. But, dude, so you must, I mean, you, so you start playing, when did you start playing music? Like, you, you know, you start listening to it. Uh, it sounds like you've been, that weren't just a listener, but you, uh, yeah, um, got pretty well, involved I, in it yourself. Yeah, I well, I uh, you know, I played guitar as a kid, um, but just kind of like like on my own. I was in a really really bad uh, band in high school, um, but then like I I mostly just like went to shows. I was just kind of like I was always there, um, but I wasn't really that personally involved with it outside of maybe my writing. Like I would do some kind of like journalism here and there, like for the Zine or different kind of websites. Over the years, there were a couple of times where I would like do reviews for a website or something. But um, in like 2008 or so, um, so I was like in my mid 20s, I uh, I joined a uh, a death metal band as vocalist, and I did that for I don't know maybe seven or eight years. Um, okay. and that was that was a lot of fun. The band I was in, we didn't go anywhere, but. It was a lot of fun. We uh, we had a couple of like sort of almost moments where like there was like a little bit of a t chance we were going to get to tour with X Toll, that like Christian like band from Sweden. Um, yeah, yeah. We on uh, Peter Espival. Yeah, last year. Hell yeah, Hell yeah. that's awesome. Uh, the, yeah, those guys are uh, next level. They're incredible. But uh, we we had a chance to maybe go on a leg with them. We never did, but um, we put out like an album and an EP. And, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and then um, I didn't do anything musically for a while. Um, I just started um, playing in uh, in a band called Wither Moth, um, which is like a kind of a tech death sort of thing. They're not like a Christian band or anything. Um, I started doing vocals for them this year, and I'm just kind of getting my feet wet with them, hoping to like do some playing live and stuff like that. So. Haven't done a lot nice. of bands, just mostly been to a ton of shows. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I got a fun game to play. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like the older you get, right? The more when you the more you have situations where you meet someone for the first time and it, you're like, I've met this guy before. Mm. Like I've seen this uh <laughs> I've seen this NPC in <laughs> in prior days or something okay, like that. Yeah. And I feel like metal shows 
and like scenes in general are full of like these archetypes that you see repeated like in a lot of different places in all throughout time periods like one of the ones that i think of is there's always a guy who is just like so he wants to be in a band so bad and you have to you have to love the guy because he's so into music and he so wants to make it work but it just never works and like he starts to kind of age out of the scene and his bandmates just keep getting younger until pretty soon like he's playing ska with a bunch of junior high kids and like (laughs) his wife on the drums (laughs) i feel like that's me i feel like you're just describing me (laughs) like i'm definitely the old dude in my band you know like for sure yeah i I, things would have to get pretty bleak before i was in a ska band but uh (laughs) that's that's good that's we'll see you can always go lower of character Yeah, yeah, for sure, dude. Scott sucks because you have to split the, you know, you have to split the guarantee with thirteen other people. And dude, I just watched this crazy documentary about Ska, and they were talking about that. They were talking about how like those guys like made zero money. Yeah. Because their bands were fucking gigantic, and you know they have to split it a million ways. Yeah, and they're filling up a fifteen passenger <laughs> van pulling a trailer with gas. It's like yeah, yeah, horns are heavy. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Freaking nuts. <laughs> Got to leave room for all those groupies too, man. Yeah, I like, know, I don't dude. know. So, yeah, so definitely, definitely there's the old guy at the shows. You've always got, like, the, the crowd killer guy, you know. The guy oh, the crowd TV. killers for real. The pro- yeah. fingerless gloves and a backwards hat. <laughs> <laughs> at the venue that I yes. would go to in high school, there was a, the crowd killer was, like, this big-ass dude with a butterfly tramp stamp. And he, oh, fuck. he had he a always, butterfly yeah. tramp stamp, and he always had his shirt off in the pit. And he just, yeah, we loved it. It was funny yeah. shit to us. There is this dude, and I do not at all mind using his real name because, uh, yeah, I just don't care. But uh, there was this dude named Brett Ray, and he was at uh, every show uh, in the early 2000s, and um, he was the crowd killer of all crowd killers. He's this great big guy, and he'd lumber around and just, like, kick the shit out of people, kick people in the back, and, like, you know, do the spin kick into the crowd, but just really lay people out to a really unreasonable degree, you know, even for crowd killing, and I remember he started getting banned from all the local (laughs) venues, so that to the point where, and Granted, this is still, you know, 2001. I remember seeing flyers on Zanga or whatever for a show, and it would say, uh, Brett Ray will not be in attendance at the bottom. Like, they, so people would go. (laughs) Because otherwise, people wouldn't go, I guess, if they knew Brett was going. Um, We definitely had that NPC in Lynchburg, Kyle Brady. Yeah, Kyle fucking. It was such a turn. His name was Kyle, yeah. Yeah, he would just deck. Little kids looking the other way. <laughs> yeah, I just like, punch him right in the back of the head. Like the last time I remember seeing him at a show, he had a cast on one arm and he <laughs> he just donkey punched this kid with his cast and like flattened him. They had to t- like the an ambulance came. Holy oh shit. Oh my god. Yeah, wow. it was at I don't remember the name of the venue, but it was in the town where uh Virginia University of Virginia is in Waynesboro. Yeah, okay, I don't and know. It was rough. They never that had could, like much for bouncers, so it was like the roughest shows ever. Like the first those shows never did. like local shows are close to local. The mm-hmm. security was just not a thing. There was no such thing as security at half the shows we went to. Yeah, yeah. And they get big enough that like they were super dangerous. Like the yeah. one of the first the first time that I ever really got to hang out with my wife was at a show at that venue. It was a dark. You guys have been hour. married for like five years at that point too. So it was super weird. <laughs> yeah. It's married in spirit. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's a very, it was extremely Christian. It's like, we were still wearing each other's purity rings, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's okay. So I always remember there being like one kid who was young. He's young. Mm-hmm. He's really skinny. And he's wearing like very baggy, like uh, carpenter jeans and a long black, probably a stained T-shirt. And he's, <laughs> Wait, he's, is it stained or is it the band stained? The band stained. Okay. It's always <laughs> like a new metal band 
like a radio rock new metal band like butt rock yeah. and he's in the pit and just kind of like swinging around like he twirls a lot and then he tries yeah, to kind of like shoulder lot. people yeah, yeah that, kid's did some head that kid's name is travis that kid's name is travis that's your they usually bucks. have like kind of a bowl cut thing going on too where they're like yeah. trying to grow yeah. their hair out yeah absolutely very works straight at, hair yes. works at pizza hut yeah, yeah. for sure <laughs> <laughs> that's tra- that's yeah. that's the trav i know and love yeah there's, there's always like old punk guy who's got like mm-hmm. the big boots and the battle jacket with the studs and all the patches yeah. maybe a kilt might be in a kill there's a good chance and he kind of does that like yeah punk skank that they do stuff you're right the the stank the stank skank um <laughs> yeah you've always got like the um uh, like crust punk kids like smoking outside or whatever you know yeah cool. yeah absolutely it's like passing around lice mm-hmm. yeah just passing it, <laughs> how can they pass around lice they all have completely shaved heads Oh man! I don't know, man, there's some gnarly dreads out there. There are some That's gnarly what I was dreads thinking. out there. Oh, the, the oh the crust punk kids. Yeah, I uh, I dated a crusty girl once, and uh, she had this awesome, <laughs> awesome dread uh, thing going on where it was like the sides of her head were shaved, and then she had these like dreads in the middle, and they like went down, like down to like you know her whole back, and yeah, she didn't have lights, I don't think, but she, she did. She smelled smell like Spencer's. Good. She smelled <laughs> like if Spencer's um, only sold Parmesan cheese, and they did not <laughs> pro- they did not store it properly. They had, they had no AC, and they just had a bunch of loose Parmesan cheese just peppered everywhere, and uh, that's what she smelled like. <laughs> I, it was great. I wish so bad that I would have just leaned hard into something like yeah. Sam. You had the long dreads, like <laughs> yeah, that's a I did cool thing. For a minute. That was I did too, synonymous man. I did with you. Too. Oh, did you, dude? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. I, I shaved them after I got rid of them after my uh, after my second kid was born. I was just like, I'm fucking done with this shit. I can't keep it up. I'm just... Yeah, you can't be a dread dad. It's too no. much. <laughs> They're starting to drive me nuts too, dude. I didn't keep up with it. I kept them so good for a while, and then and plus, also dangerous for white people to have dreads now because of like, yes. I don't know, people call it cultural appropriation and want to kick the shit out of you. So I got That's rid of them at a good time. I know. Same here. I kind of dodged the bullet on that one. I had dreads for a while and then I uh, I cut my hair. So I had like a short haircut in front, but I left all my dreads on the back of my head. So I had this sick like dread mullet Yes, for a while and it was tight, but uh yeah, I cut that off, and it was right around the time I cut it that people started talking about that, and I was kind of like, okay, well, I'm probably yeah. not going to get dreads again because I am not going to uh, argue against that. <laughs> I'm yeah, not gonna, I would, I'm not yeah. going to die on that hill, but I will also say that the only people who I've ever not, – not the only people I've ever heard talk about it. It's the internet. Yeah. Lots of different people have talked about it, but in person, the only people who ever brought up that, that concept was just like white people. Every black person yeah. I ever met was just like, dude, that's fucking sick. Can I see yeah. those? Can I touch those? I was like, yeah, go for it. It's like, yeah, I never, it was never really a problem. Um, and even still on the internet, I do feel like it's mostly white people who want to complain about white people having dreads. It, it does seem that way. Um, but yeah, it's like, I'm just going to kind of avoid it. I'm with you on that one. Yep, totally. And, uh, and you're it, totally entitled to the opinion of that. They're stupid. Right. And you shouldn't have them. I'm not going to, I'm not right. going to convince you that it was the best decision I ever made. I'm just going right. to say that it yeah. wasn't a problem when I had them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, uh, you know, I think with stuff like this, and I'm sure you guys would agree, it's like the best, I think the best policy is just to err on the side of compassion, you know? And so it's yep. like, yeah, uh, you know, I may not get the whole cultural appropriation like argument there, but. I don't know. Maybe it's right. I don't know. Cause I'm definitely coming from a few places of privilege, you know? So it's just kind of like, uh, yeah, I know it kind of works out because I think I got the dreads thing out of my system anyway, but Same. I, I don't plan on doing it anytime soon again. And part of the reason is because of that. It's like, well, even if I think it's okay, like I don't want to like bum somebody out because I, they might legitimately feel like I'm like doing something shitty about their culture or whatever. So, and let's be honest, a lot of people who have them, theirs are nasty as fuck and they should just yes. get rid of them anyway like a lot yes. of you have nasty fucking dreads so yeah yeah absolutely it's just time maybe 
Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So where did uh, so youth group, strong presence, all of that, like where did uh, your faith travel from that point forward? Yeah, so um, in, okay, so in high school, I had a really, really like crazy traumatic thing happen where um, a whole bunch, uh, like basically my entire, this sounds made up, but I promise it's true. My entire friend group, I had a big friend group that were like all super into Christian stuff. They all joined a cult at the same time, like a straight Holy up, shit. like real deal cult. And um, they were completely insane they like lost their fucking minds and they all moved to ohio to live in a barn um to like street preach full time like it was insane and um but before they left uh i was like the only one of them that didn't join and so i was their number one target for harassment um and so i had this pretty big group of people like just hounding me at my house and at school and at church, they would come to my church and cause disruptions and stuff. And, um, dude, it was gnarly. Like I'm legitimately, like I got diagnosed with PTSD from it and stuff. Like it was insane. And so I had this horrific experience with like losing all these people and having this intense cult. And like, I would compare them most closely to like the Fred Phelps group probably where it was like, uh, are you guys familiar? Uh, unfortunately, probably with Fred Phelps group. They're the ones that protest like the military funerals and shit like that. Yeah. Westboro. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah Westboro. Um, and unfortunately that's my neck of the woods too. They're right, right around here, but yeah, um, they're like right between us. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to like, we form like and- the top and bottom of a hate <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, but they, they were kind of like that. Um, and so that like really messed me up and, um, kind of left me with a lot of questions. Um, but also I was feeling pretty at odds, um, with, uh, while I didn't want anything to do with that cult stuff, I was also kind of feeling at odds with my church that I grew up in because when I became a teenager and I started becoming really serious about my faith, I started reading scripture for myself. I started seeing all these things that didn't line up where it was like, um, of course nine 11 happened when I was 14 and um uh all all, like there's the war in the middle east happening and all this stuff and i remember that was during the time that i was reading the gospels for the first time on my own and and like reading the words of christ and then seeing all the stuff that all the christians were talking about supporting it was like it was so clearly opposite and i remember trying to talk to people about trying to talk to my parents or people at my church about it because i was concerned and i was really kind of horrified by the response because it was so uh it it seemed so heretical to be talking about things like uh like not supporting war um Mm -hmm. a, a lot of things like that just started not meshing with me where i was like there's the jesus in scripture um that tells us to love our enemies um and then there is the Jesus that I'm kind of being sold at church and I'm starting to see that maybe it's not the exact same guy. Um, so I was, I was kind of confused coming out of high school. I kind of drifted around for a few years. Um, I was in a kind of a bad place mentally because of all the cult stuff. Um, I didn't really know what to do. I kind of dropped out of church for a while. And then, um, for a while I got really into that kind of like Shane Claiborne Mm -hmm. brand of Christianity, you know, talking about like, we had him on too. Oh, no shit. Oh, my God. That would be I would be so starstruck if I ever met that guy, because <laughs> like I, w- I used to be like so into and he is a great dude. But uh, yeah. he was pivot- yeah. he was really pivotal for me yes. as well in college. So I hear absolutely, you, um, you know, and I, I always really relate to Aaron from me without you, because if you listen to those first few me without you albums, like he was on a similar trajectory of kind of searching and trying to figure stuff out. And so I got really into that kind of crust punk christianity for a while did like a house church with some people um and uh kind of got out of that um kind of went back into church for a while now i've been kind of out of it for a while um i don't know i i think that i'm right now where i'm at is where a lot of people are at where um i'm seeing what the evangelical church is and i'm like well that's for sure not 
what I am. Like whatever I am, it's not what that label is anymore. Like mm-hmm. the, that Christian thing is like not my faith. You know, it's uh, I don't I don't relate to this like right wing like nationalist uh, Christianity one bit. Uh, I think that you know the the Trump presidency and everything really uh, disillusioned a lot of people. Um, and also the church's relative silence, um, about George Floyd and all of these different things that were happening in the country. It was just really gross. Um, mm-hmm. and so now I'm kind of like in a place where it's like when people ask me, I'm like, you know, it's like, well, I believe in God or like, I'm trying, I'm really trying to believe, you know? Um, and like, I believe in, in Jesus, but, um, I, uh, other than that, man, who knows? Sometimes it's like all, all I've got is like, well, I think God's real and I think God's good. But, you know, that's about it. Uh, I, I don't really know much beside of that. So here lately, like I've been uh, actually because of my like traumatic past with church stuff, it can be really hard for me to read scripture. And I think that's kind of common sure. for people that have dealt with spiritual abuse. Absolutely. Um, so here lately, I've been reading like more like Eastern texts and things like that to kind of supplement my old Bible study time. And that's been incredibly rewarding and healing. I just read through the Upanishads, uh, the uh, one of the Hindu scriptures, and it was incredibly, incredibly encouraging. And I'm starting to crack into the Bhagavad Gita right now. And so uh, that's been pretty cool. Have, I don't talk to my parents about that stuff. <laughs> They'd be really worried about it. <laughs> but, uh, but it's like, it's like, man, I want to connect with God, but, uh, like for sure, you know, like I totally, like if God's real, like I want to connect with them, but like, uh, it's, I don't really know how to do it through, um, through those older modes anymore. I just, I feel really kind of confused and disappointed, um, by Christianity so much. And it's like, uh, Christ is, is great, but the, the church is just such a mess right now. It's so gross. Um, and so, yeah, I've been just kind of stepping back, I guess. Yeah. Dude, I, it's, I think what's so strange about it is that for, for people like you and, and many other people who grew up evangelical, it's so American Christianity is so enveloped in like, it's not even about American Christianity, I guess, exactly. But you're, you're so conditioned in that environment that even when you're trying to, like, when you can say like, I, I, you know, I think I believe in God and, and something about Jesus is compelling. And I think there's a correlation, but any way that you're going to get that package deal is in an area or arena. That's kind of a triggering setting. And it makes it so fucking difficult to like experience that in like a healthy way when there aren't, there aren't avenues to explore it outside of doing it independently through books or something like that. Like it's just, there are progressive churches and things like that, but depending on like the language around it and the way that it's talking, because I still, I've I've mentioned it all the time, but I still go to a church and I, I do have a hard time, you know, even going through certain liturgies. I'm like, uh, I don't think I want to, I don't, I can't say that really. Yes, I, I like yeah. the idea of collectively like saying something and not actually all agreeing upon it. And there's no ex- expectation that you agree with everything that's mm-hmm. being said or that you're saying, but it's conflicting and it's not, it's, it's definitely an effort for me to, to participate in those portions of it. So I hear what you're saying, dude. It's like, cause I still gravitate towards Jesus and I think that's a good cornerstone for me. And it's allows me to live a life that I find uh, life giving or fruitful, beneficial. It brings a lot, it brings me peace in a lot of ways. And so like wanting to still have that but knowing that most of the areas that i'll be able to quote unquote connect with other people on it is in an area that isn't going to be a comfortable space for me and one that my wishy-washiness quote unquote would be very unwelcome and it's just like i don't know it it can be isolating for a lot of people i'm thankful that i found a spot where nobody is worried about that yeah i don't have to keep this a secret they're all they all generally listen. A lot of them listen to it and they're just like, Oh, that's cool. And then we still kind of show up and do our thing. So I don't know, man, I I really hear what you're saying. And I, it's so it is sad and frustrating that at the end of the day, a lot of people do just have to give up on it uh, simply because they can't, there isn't a space or an area 
around them in which they could actively engage in it in a way that doesn't make them want to just fucking jump off a bridge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, a ton of my friends, uh, it's just not their thing anymore and I get it. Um, and I don't fault them for that. Um, you know, there's something that I feel like when you're, when you're involved in church or at least in kind of like the, a lot of the kind of young churches now and stuff, something that I was hearing a lot that I, I found really compelling was in these church settings or podcasts or whatever, you would always hear people talk about uh, God's love and how big it is and like how surprising it is and how it's like, God's love is like so crazy. Like we can't even like, we can't even figure it out. And his mercy is so big. It's so unending all of this stuff. Um, And I think for me thinking about that has made me feel a lot better in, in kind of like walking away for a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. because it's like, well, if I'm going to believe that God's love and his mercy is like so big, I think maybe a lot of this stuff that I thought was necessary for quote unquote salvation or whatever, um, is like completely, uh, missing the point and not at all like what we're supposed to be focusing on. I, I, uh, got coffee with a dude from my old church that I really, really look up to, um, a while ago. And at the time he was wanting me to do like a Bible, like lead a Bible study thing with him, which I ended up doing at the time. It was one of the last things I did with the church and I'm glad I did it. But I remember I was talking to him beforehand about it, about how I really didn't think I should be leading other people. Cause I was like, dude, I'm like about to like, I like barely believe right now, you know, like I'm like on the edge of just like walking away from this whole thing. And, uh, something that he said to me was like, and granted this is a dude that's like in church and he's like in the word and all this stuff. He said to me, he was like, you know, sometimes I, I suspect that, um, that this isn't like the only way, you know, like that this is not the only way to know God. Um, but this is just like our avenue to know God. And, um, I feel like that's been kind of, um, the direction I've been kind of leaning in lately, which is like, Maybe Christ ties it all together, but um, I don't know who am I to to say like uh, how to know God or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think the me without you guys it seemed to have maybe kind of leaned in that direction too from some like uh, interview stuff I've seen with them. I don't want to put words in their mouth or anything like that, but I think lately I read a book called The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. Yeah, Great and uh, incredible. Um, and he, you know, he 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 proposes in the book that um maybe christ's sacrifice was good for all time and for all people um and when i've been reading the upanishads i've been kind of approaching it from a perspective of like well these are people that were alive thousands of years before christ and these were people that had no contact with or knowledge of the jews um but they were just people that were praying and just wanted to know God, you know, and, and thinking about it that way and reading it, it's like, wow, it's incredible how like much the same this is, you know? And so maybe yeah. this is like really like what God spoke to those people, but who knows, man, I just run like a shit post page. No one should <laughs> follow what I say, <laughs> but that's, that's what's been bringing comfort to me. I think is just that like, it's like, you know, we always talk about like how big and loving God is. Well, like maybe, maybe he really is. And like, maybe, um, I don't have to have like everything figured out as much as I thought I had to have figured out where I really thought I needed to know where I stood on all this theological stuff. Now I don't know at all about that stuff. Yeah. And I think what the guy you were just talking about in your church was saying about not knowing that that's the only way but it's maybe our way or our avenue i think that's a helpful way to look at it too and it i think that approach could free a lot of people into being like oh stakes are much lower that like coming at it with that mindset then i could do that here maybe i could maybe do that in this space only because it's not coming at it from like you have to do it it's just like okay i i can i can incorporate my understanding and the things I've learned through this lens and through this vocabulary. And maybe it'll be useful to somebody or maybe it won't be, but it makes it less about obligation or uh, feeling like you're like kind of forced into it. And so, yeah. so I hear that too, man. I think that's all really cool, but don't stop. Uh, if you change your mind about anything, just make sure you keep running a shit posting page. Cause that's what I need. <laughs> 
Thank you. Dude, can I tell you guys, uh, can I tell you guys how I started Rip Girl Jeans? Because I think yeah. this is a really good story. Yes, please do. <laughs> I wanted to ask and uh, I think that's a great way to close this out is how Okay, cool. Yeah. Begins. Yeah, uh, cuz this is uh it's it's a good story. So, well, it, it, I say it's a good story, but it has a really depressing start, but I promise like it, you know, gets better or whatever, I guess. But uh so it was a couple of years ago, um what was it? Um it was pre pre pandemic. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I, a whole bunch of bad shit happened to me at once. Um, my girlfriend of seven years like left me like with no warning, um, and then I lost my job, and then I got really really crazy sick, the sickest I've ever gotten in my whole life. This all happened within like a month, and uh, it was we never completely figured it out. It was kind of a mysterious illness that lasted for about a year and a half, but Holy it was basically almost everything I ate uh, would make me like violently, violently ill. It was like having the stomach flu for like a year and a half, basically. Oh. And I lost, I lost like 65 pounds. I was living on water and white rice and carrots. Um, I was just, um, I was just like miserable, obviously. And I was, too sick to work or anything like that. And I had all this time to myself. And um, so I downloaded uh, the Reddit app and I started making memes for Reddit. And so I would like, I started making these like shit posts and I had never really messed around with it before. And I, I, I would make these memes that I thought were like so funny. Like I would make memes that like, I was like in tears laughing because I, I thought they were so funny. And then I put it on Reddit and they get like 50 upvotes or something. They wouldn't go anywhere. Like no one gave a shit, you know? And I was like, gosh, this is so frustrating. I made a whole bunch of these things and I, I thought they were so, f- some of them still I think are really, really funny. Um, they just weren't going anywhere. And I remember looking, I would look at the front page of Reddit and be like, dude, this normie shit is just blowing up. You know, it's like this, like these memes that would make the number one thing were never funny. Like the, you know, the, the top front page posts on Reddit each day. It was just like, dude, these aren't funny at all. And then I got the idea. I was like, I should try to make one of these memes and like, see what happens. And so I made a meme that I didn't think was funny. (laughs) <laughs> about a video game I had never played. I made a FIFA meme, and I never played the FIFA games or whatever. <laughs> um, really normy ass meme. Uh, def like, uh, just just stupid. Didn't think it was funny at all. But I I was mimicking the voice, and uh, it got ninety thousand upvotes. And <laughs> uh, it was number one on Reddit for like uh, at least one full day. Um, and then uh, and then a week later. I did it again with another meme. <laughs> I, I, I made another meme. Uh, I made it about Madden, which I've also never played. And, uh, and it made it to the front page. And uh, I was like, well, that, that was a fun experiment. And I got rid of Reddit. And uh, my roommate at the time, he was like, he was like, dude, like you should really think about like doing this. You know, you should really think about like, I, I feel like you could actually maybe do it. Like if you got an Instagram, maybe you could find people that actually like think your shit is funny and get it or whatever. Um, and so I, I kind of had it sitting around for a while, not really doing much of anything with it. But then uh, maybe about a year later, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then I, I started ripped girl jeans. And so I've been doing it. Um, it I hit a year, April 1st. Um, okay. Nice. Uh, just a year and a few months. But um, that first year, I posted every single day. Um, now I'm posting like multiple times a day and it's, it's really hard cause it's all original, you know? So I'm like having to come yeah, dude, up. I don't know how you do it, dude. I don't know how I'm going to keep doing it. That's for sure. There's definitely only so many jokes you can make about this. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I still um, post yeah. once a day. So I'm floored by anyone who can manage to do more than that. Um, memes are so hard. Cause like <sighs> it's hard. You have an idea in your head, but like, at the core of like a good meme is it just has to have like no fat on it Mm. like exactly to the point it hits the nail on the head and it's just there's not like you can't have like context really built into it and that's so true it takes like a very like you have to really understand the uh the vernacular in order to to really get one to punch you know i always look at memes uh i think of them like puzzles for me or or like not just memes, but like a joke, it's always like a puzzle because like if you expect something, it's almost never funny. 
Um, there are those kind of jokes where the punchline, you're like, you see it coming and sometimes that makes it funny. But for the most part, that's not funny. That's why meme formats usually aren't funny once people start using them. Cause it's like, yeah, I've seen this 10 times. Right. And so it's kind of this puzzle where you find a way to surprise somebody. Um, that's really hard to do 500 times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so we'll see. I'll probably I'll probably quit after after today. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> no, we no, made no, it. No, I'm, I'm having a blast doing it, and I've gotten um, gotten to talk to a lot of really really great people. It's been uh, I mean it's been probably the most positive thing in my life the last like uh, year and some change. It's been uh, it's been so cool. It's definitely taken off. Not that it's huge or anything, but it's definitely taken off more than any creative pursuit I've ever done. And um, yeah, it'll grow exponentially too, man. I mean, people like us. Uh, mid mid thirties who grew yeah. up in the metalcore and hardcore scene that we're going to eat that we're all eating this shit up, dude. It's going to just be <laughs> people wearing a, 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 we need that stuff. Tattered faded haste the day shirt that their belly yep. hangs out the bottom of. You can yes. see their like belly button hair out the bottom of it. Absolutely. Dude, I feel kind of bad because I've been shitting on Haste the Day a lot on my page, and those guys are so nice. Yeah. <laughs> they don't deserve it at all. But I just like give them so much shit. <laughs> okay, so I'm curious. Like, given the uh the uh your art form, what mm-hmm. uh what are like some meme pages that you really like that make you laugh on a consistent basis? Oh man, they're uh So I think the funniest meme page in the world right now, um, it was this girl, her page was called Stupid Oklahoma Bitch. Um, (laughs) And she kept getting shut down. She kept getting zucked. Um, And um, she went through eight iterations of that page and kept getting shut down. Now she changed her name to God is my zaddy. Um, I think that's the funniest meme page on the internet right now. Definitely check her out. God is my zaddy. Oh, I'm following Um, this. But, uh, there's people who are doing what I'm doing, um, that are doing a killer job of it. There's a new guy named Shoguns of Joy memes, um, killing it. Um, X spirit filled cum X, uh, (laughs) is this totally wild dude I met from Spain who knows more about Christian metalcore from America in the early 2000s than I do. Um, I love the niche of this dude. I love it. It's like we, cause I feel like you grow out of the scene and you're just like, it feels lame to like, to tell people now that this was such a big part of not lame, but like people don't know how to, if you, if people don't know it, they don't know it. There's like so little to talk about. Like, that's why I was so excited to talk to you. It's like, yeah, it just, it, it's like evangelicalism in a lot of ways, where it's just, it's so fun to just sit and shoot the shit about that old world. I mean, it's got its own language and yeah. uh, it's uh, its own culture, man. It's, it's it amazing. Is. Um, I also got a shout out, uh, what like stage, stage dive. Jesus is another great one. Um, just following all of these is your name and I'm off. <laughs> I think there's one called meme crisis. He was in it before I started doing it really, really funny. Um, brutal God X brutal God X. I think maybe there's um, so many. But, I'm so unaware. There's uh there's a few that are out there. I'm by no means the only guy doing it. When I started doing it, there were only a couple of pages doing it. And those guys were super nice and kind of helped me get into it. And then, um, now that I'm doing it, there's a few I've encouraged. I've, I've had a couple of people hit me up about like maybe joining me in it. And I always tell people, Hey man, like do your own thing. I'll support you. And so a couple of two or three pages have kind of like sprung up that I've kind of helped get started. And so, yeah, there's like a little community of uh, nice. Christian hardcore shit posters online. And, <laughs> I love uh, it. It's a lot of fun, man. I love seeing the bones that pop up too in the suggested deal. When you follow a new page like that, like, Oh Yeah. Like uh, a fart wool. That's like the one that pops. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Goblin, vegan straight edge. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, there's there's just so much shit out there. There's a page called New Metal Karate Society that is crazy <laughs> funny. They are way, way, way bigger than my page. I don't even know how many thousands of followers that they have, but they're incredibly, incredibly funny. So, yeah, there's a lot of good shit out there. That's oh, man. I love that name. New Metal Karate Society. It I know, works. man. It's like I, I like ripped girl jeans, but damn, New Metal Karate Society. That is ripped good. Ripped girl jeans is so good. It's like <laughs> 
it's that was that was a staple of the scene before skinny before what before uh the yeah before levi's uh changed yeah. the game yeah absolutely they it was a five elevens at the time. Now five tens are like the biz. Yeah, I remember when I've, everyone was wearing the five elevens. I've had some people not quite get it and think that I'm a female running this page and uh, uh, like message me some weird stuff, thinking I'm a girl. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. That's so good. You should yeah. share those in your story, dude. Yeah, I have like yeah. a, a whole s- thread on our Discord about like weird messages that people get in their dms are oh. people in there who have a following and some of them are insane yeah some <laughs> unhinged people that. in this world for sure crazy crazy paul it's been great meeting you man thank you so yeah. much for for it's coming so fun, on paul. oh man this has been amazing you guys are so cool and i love your show i'm gonna keep listening to it now that i know about it and uh, dude, that's so crazy! Like you've got like all these like big name people, and so that's cool that <laughs> that's cool that you squeeze me in. So I'm a celeb now for sure. You are absolutely. That's what so dope about you. We can just talk to people who we want to talk to. I'm like, I love this meme page, so I'll see if he wants to talk to us. Hey, anytime, anytime you guys want me back on, or you want me as uh, someone to uh, just completely disrupt in a serious interview you're trying to do, just let me know. I will be there. I will do it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Yeah, man. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening. Catch you next time.